Hello ladies and gentlemen, pilots, flight simmers and anyone else randomly on YouTube just dropping by wondering how would you fly the old 747-200 Classic. Now this is my updated tutorial on the Fearless 747-200. It's the Boeing 74 Classic, the Queen of the Skies, fantastic module by Fearless that's out for X-Plane 11 and 12 highly recommend you get uh, X-Plane 12 if you don't already have it. It's really starting to mature and Felix, uh, as far as I'm aware, still supports both. I'm not sure if that's going to be um, forever. Now, what we've got here is the latest beta as of the 13th of February 2023. Um, so what I'm going to run through today is a full on complete tutorial of this aircraft for beginners i'm going to assume you know the basics of flight you know I, I can't be i can't be teaching you know pull the stick back to go up kind of thing um and nor do i wish to insult the 99 percent who i'm sure you know are already up to speed with that um i'm going to assume that you know how to get hold of a flight plan if you don't it's very simple um go to simbrief.com it's a free website to use set up an account there um fill in the information and then basically you want your from airport you know your ico code which is four letters your to airport and then choose that the aircraft type is a 747-200 and that should bring you to where we are today now i've got a little flight um towards uh, St. Martin. We're, in, we're on one of those little islands out there anyway. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the Dominion Republic or Jamaica. Or it, it's that sort of area. Um, Bermuda Triangle sort of area. Um, and that's because it's a reasonably short flight. Um, I'm at uh, a reasonably large airport, though, on one of these islands. And so this is going to be our departure point. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to go through every aspect of this aircraft, uh, you know, for somebody that's new to it. It is a fantastic aircraft, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's probably the most favourite aircraft that I have in X-Plane altogether. Um, in terms of quality, it rivals the Zebo 7 Free. Now, of course, that is a free module, but it's... Um, you know, it's a much more modern aircraft, the Zebo, um, and the the sort of quality of the Tolis, uh, any builds, you know, assuming they get their act together for X Plane 12, it it's there, um, and in some cases it's even better, and and I, and I want to stress that the developer of this aircraft, Felis, is very in touch with the community. There's an active Discord page. Um, he is on there, as far as I can tell, most days. Every time I've been on there, uh, he's been on there. I mean, don't get me wrong, he takes a break, you know, from time to time. But, like, I can't, I can't think of a day where I didn't post something and there wasn't a response from him, if not immediately, several hours later. Now, by no guarantee am I holding him to that standard. It's just been my experience on a few times I've had cause uh, to post on there. I posted some bugs and literally within two or three weeks, there was an update to the aircraft um, at, the, at the very most could have even been less uh, where those bugs were fixed. And so I, I to me, that is a huge part of the aircraft. It's almost like a review as much as a tutorial, I guess you could say. All right. So clearly I've picked the old Pan Am livery, clearly no longer a thing. But anybody that flew around in the 80s and 90s, I'm sure you will have seen airports littered with these monstrosities parked up. And when I say monstrosities, it's kind of an ugly name for, uh, you know, the, the 74 is such a beautiful aircraft, iconic. Um, I love the textures on it. It does look a little worn, this one. We've got some dirt here and there, although you can see they've tried to clean it up. Um, and you can hear there, actually, the engine's rattling. When we get close to it, got a little bit of wind there just blowing the engines around all right so let's jump inside the aircraft and make a start and so the first thing i'll say is yes you can follow all the checklists and it is fun to do a few times um, and you may wish you know for the sake of quote unquote doing things properly to always follow the checklist and one of the things i like about this is you do have the uh, sort of like an audio call out and what it'll do is as the audio is calling out 
um, one of the other, you know, the the first officer um, who is actually one of the voices who's who sadly passed away um, in the previous year. There's a little plaque uh, been put in there by Fearless. Um, so the voice that you'll hear in many cases is from the guy who who sadly passed away, and also the flight engineer. The, the two separate voices, so you kind of get an idea of you know who's reading the checklist or calling out whatever it is. Um, another thing for those who are unfamiliar with the aircraft is that not only do we have a flight engineer's station over here, it is fully modelled and simulated. It's not like the Concorde aircraft where 90% of it, 95 is just for show and you can twizzle the buttons and they don't do anything. On this, the buttons actually do something. Now, some of them may make less of a difference than others. For example, <laughs> just to point out the obvious, if we twizzle this map light here that's going to change how bright the map light is, it's not going to cause the aircraft to drop out the sky or anything. If you were to twizzle, I don't know, the battery, the standby power, or, um, you know, cut off the engine circuit generators during flight, that may have more of an impact on the outcome of the flight. And so, I mean, it, it, it's all there. And, and as in real life, you know, if, if you stir up the heat on the fuel, maybe doesn't impact it quite as much as, I don't know, disconnecting some of the fuel pumps, for example. All right, so with that said and done, um, something else I want to point out is that there are three, uh, the, I think there's three. Yes, there are. There are three tablets in the aircraft, but they all repeat each other. So it's not like, I don't know those of you who are familiar with the Airbus A320 um, in Flight Sim, Microsoft Flight Simulator, where there's basically separate instances of the tablet. You can even run another instance on your own physical tablet that connects in through your Wi-Fi into the computer and into the X. So it's not like that. They're the copy of the same. Um, something else, frame rate wise, you can see what I'm doing here. Now I'm recording this on OBS. I'm doing it in 1440, um, set up to 60 frames a second. You can see I'm basically getting around uh, low 40s averaging. Um, I would say that may even drop a little bit lower in very detailed uh, cities. I've got my X-Plane um, settings, I don't mind showing them briefly, um, pretty much maxed out. If we come to the graphics here, um, everything pretty much maxed out. I find rendering distance actually takes a bigger hit than most of the others put together. Um, so uh, be aware that if you're used to like 60 frames in the tallest, especially expect to get about 40 in this. At least that's my experience. Um, I've got the flight plan loaded in here, but before I start running through it and before we start putting battery and so on into the aircraft, one final thing I wanted to go through, and that is the options menu. So if you come on to the home page and then options, and again, ju just for any doubters here, um, they can see we've got the options page there. And if we come back to the flight engineers, um, you know, these, the options there. So, you know, trust me when I say they repeat each other and it's not, uh, dependent or required, uh, you, you know, whether you've got the aircraft battery power or not, uh, these tablets are independent. And as far as I can tell, the quote battery on these tablets lasts forever. I know in some simulators, and again, I'm thinking of the Airbus A320 in Flight Sim, a uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, you know, they actually simulate the battery power on the tablet and you need to plug it in with the aircraft power to keep it topped up. Um, so some big things here that I want to point, um, you've got your nose wheel tiller. Um, so this is, you know, how are you going to steer the nose on the ground? You've got the option of tiller, um, your rudder pedals, or, you know, actually rolling the joystick side to side. Um, I've not had calls to use those options because I like using, uh, the tiller option. Not that I have a tiller, but I have the warthog throttle and I use the little, what you'd normally define as the friction lever, that little gray thing. Um, up and down, I use that as as the tiller, um, and that basically controls this thing here, which is kind of the same sort of shape and the way that I move my tiller. It basically that, that the uh, friction lever is kind of like that, anyways. Um, another big one, and this is huge actually, the nav system on this. So Fearless added, and this is one of the big changes that was not like this back when this uh, aircraft came out, which is why I really wanted to make an update to this video. You've got the SIVA, uh, sorry, the LTN-92 system. So originally um, you had the SIVA 
and the FMC. And so the SEVA is this, which is the really old school um, navigation system. So when, you know, those of you that are familiar with new aircraft, the Boeings, um, you've got your FMCs in your Airbuses, you've got your McDo's that are in a similar position. This was like the very first version of that. It was a, and the only thing that you can put into this and get out of it are coordinates. Now, once the coordinates are in, it can tell you, well, what heading and how far, but that's it. It, it's, it doesn't give you anything on like height or uh, fuel efficiency, um, what speed or anything like that. It is just a, a, a two-dimensional coordinate system. Works surprisingly well, um, and that is the most basic version. Now, these are always repeated no matter what you pick in triplicates. So, you know, every station, the pilot, co-pilot and uh, flight engineer have all got their own version and they kind of back each other up. Now, Felis, you know, he's gone to a lot of simulation depth on this aircraft. These systems drift. And so what that means is once you align them, the longer they've been aligned, the more they will drift one way or the other. It, it, as far as I can tell, it's basically a little bit random, so it's never going to be the same twice. Um, these very older systems were not able to quote unquote fix themselves in the flight. You know, the new FMCs and the McDo's, they're still going to drift a little bit as you fly, despite the latest, you know, laser ring gyros and, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the avionics space and whatnot. Um, but the way that those newer systems sort of fix themselves, if that's what you want to call it, is they'll get a GPS signal in, they'll get um, a VOR DME information and they'll compare what, where the plane thinks it is versus where it can confirm it is using like a GPS and a VOR signal something like that uh, these systems were not capable of doing that and so the fur i say the further but really it's a little more to do with time than it is distance but basically the sort of the same thing right you're going to be flying further the, the longer you go um these systems will drift more and more and at some point um would become basically unusable they'd become so inaccurate so if you were to take a full load of fuel uh, you'd absolutely want to make sure that if if you are going for one of these marathon flights where you're trying to get absolute far as you can, you'd want to make sure that the 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 final phase of your flight is over several VOR beacons that you can sort of refine for yourself where you are. Um, you certainly don't want to be finding some little solitary NDB beacon out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the Pacific. After you know, I wouldn't recommend using this system for that. Um, coming on then, so here we've got the FMC. Um, you know, nothing uh, should hopefully look too unfamiliar about this. Now, I have got to be honest here. I have never, ever used the FMC in this aircraft because to me, the fun of this aircraft is the old schoolness of it. I don't want to jump into an old school aircraft to then rip out what the avionics that are in there and replace it with something newer and more up to date. And so I can't say um, how well this works with the system, um, whether the uh, VNAV stuff is implemented. Um, I, I'm going to suspect not just because of the way that the autopilot is limited, but uh, please don't hold me to that. And it's certainly not something we'll be covering in any great depth, because again, uh, we're in the old plane because of the old system. That brings us to the latest system, the LTN 92. And this is. A, imagine it like you've got the really old systems that I was showing you that only have coordinates and that's it. You've got the newer FMCs and McDo's. This is like a halfway shop. This, although it didn't have three-dimensional navigation, so it's not capable of heights and speeds and all of that stuff, it is capable of putting in RNAV fixes. So you can put in, um, you know, your five-letter identifiers for RNAV fixes and... If you update your IRAC cycle through like a Navigraph, um, these will all be updated. If you don't, you know, no matter, these will just be the IRAC cycle that, you know, you have with your X-Plane, whatever that is. And forgive me, I don't know what version that is off by heart, but the point is these systems will work for you. And these are the systems we're going to be using today because I find them that they're the... They're the most fun, but they by no means take away the job of the pilot. You know, the new FMCs and the McDo's, uh, I don't think I'm going to take much convincing here of anyone. 
they take away the vast majority of what the pilot had to do and think about. It does it all for you. Sure, if you're on VATSIM, you've got to think about what do I say on frequency? And if the controller gets me to deviate off the course, I've now got to come out of this and over to the heading mode. But that aside, you know, the newer aircraft, they basically, you know, I mean, you know, there's that there's that little joke on the Airbus that, you know, the after takeoff checklist is wheels up, flaps in, coffee table out and takeoff checklist complete. And there's a bit of truth to that. Um and so, yeah, this is the system we'll be using today. And again, the LTN 92. Now, I have a real comprehensive tutorial on the channel on the LTN 92, but I will cover it briefly today, like a quick start, if you like. Um, something else here, we've got uh, a few other things, you know, that I, I, I'm going to insult your intelligence. Um, INS Align, for those that don't know, is, you know, how long does it take this computer to align? And, you know, you've got your switches up here to uh, control that. Um, and it basically makes it very quick, a few seconds, if not instant, versus a real time. And the real time depends exactly where you are in the world, but basically allows seven, eight minutes for the system, uh, sometimes a little longer if you're uh, operating the, towards the extremes. Um, your INS source here, and it, this is almost, if you want to view it as like as a cheat, um, and, it, and that is because when this aircraft, the 7-4 Classic, came around, there was no such thing as GPS, or if there was, it was in, in such an early infancy or it was reserved for the military only that it wasn't certified for, you know, aircraft to be able to refine their position. And so if you want the aircraft uh, system to basically allow itself to update using the GPSs, um, then turn on SIM GPS. I don't, um, so I leave it on real. To me, it's just more... Realistic again, I'm trying to recreate what it was like to fly, you know, a few decades ago. And, I, and I'm aware that, yeah, but we're flying today. Okay, but if you still had the technology from decades ago, um, you wouldn't be able to just pull in a modern GPS signal. And uh, again, so I'm trying to have it as old school as possible. Um, sync the captain flight officer gauges, uh, fairly self explanatory for those that have flown any sort of aircraft, basically. If I change the weather on this one here, what it's going to do is copy um, the same thing over to um, the first officer side. Now, for some reason, um, you've still got to set the backup one independently. Now, usually you're going to be on captain's side. Um, so you'd normally set, I don't know, let's go 3005 or whatever it is. We haven't done the weather yet. 3005. Um, and then as well, if you've got some time to twiddle your thumbs, come back here. And you may want to do the same again for the uh, flight engineers panel there and uh, there. So, you know, 3005, there would be 3010 or 10. Um, so, you know, that's kind of that one. Um, so really, you're saving yourself the twizzle of one. You still got to check. I say you got to change for it. You don't at all. Um, ideally, you just want to change your two. Um, and again, if you've got time, change your flight engineers. And it changes this one for you or, or vice versa. Uh, crew voices, you know, self-explanatory. And then I'll leave that uh, where it is. And page two, auto throttle um, blocks your throttle. I highly recommend turning that on um, because even if you don't have a shaky throttle, like I don't, you know, the whole sensors in the Warthog are not shaky. Um, if you move them even slightly, you accidentally knock it, whatever, um, if the auto throttle is on, it's going to knock it out. Now, I'm not entirely sure where the crossover on that changes, you know, how much tolerance there is. Um, there was a bit of discussion about allowing tolerance up to a certain point. But at the, if you moved it like really quickly, it would disconnect. But I'm not sure um, how that was implemented. Uh, two axis throttle. So if you've got the reverses on the same throttle, um, use kill objects. So I want to turn this on. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, what it what it does but it's something i think it, what it basically does is it deletes things that you can't see to try and improve performance to a certain point um yoke manipulation i'm not sure i guess that means you can maybe click and drag it looks like that is it so if we turn that off yeah now look i can't click and drag so that's what that one is and then last but not least cabin lights are on that's just for the back i'm going to leave it on and i'm not going to worry about that and with that we've completed the options 
Now, one other thing then, what, what the, or rather the first thing, let's get cracking with it now. Um, jumping in, and again, this is just the cold and dark start. The only thing that I have done is loading my flight plan in here using Avitab. That's the only thing that I've done. And again, there's Simbrief uh, to look at that. Um, and make sure that you've got the Avitab plugin if you don't already. And again, if you don't know how to do those things, I recommend uh, checking out a tutorial. Just make a little note of it and uh, check out a tutorial on that afterwards. Uh, if you haven't done that, you know, or, or, or if you're feeling up on it, just uh, go to uh, search the Avitab and in install it in your explain resources folder. All right. So coming now over to the ground menu, GND. Uh, this is the best place to start. This is the menu clearly you're presented with. And this is what you want to deal with when you come in. And so before anything else, I like to put usually, unless I'm thinking something specific, set the chocks, connect ground power unit. Now, usually we hear the voices. I can only assume uh, that's uh, coming. Oh, yeah, there's definitely sound. Um, so coming over to the flight engineers. So uh, it may have depended on the fact that we didn't have the doors open or the power on. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that was about. Either way. With power now established to the aircraft and the chocks on. And again, if we come outside, I believe... Yeah, there we go. We see the chocks are modelled. We see them round the wheels there, the tyres. And if I just disconnect my camera briefly, there's the ground power unit. So, you know, very basic one, but it, it serves to do the job. And so coming inside the aircraft, it seems to completely block the noise out, which is nice. Sometimes... Uh, the APUs inside the cockpit are far too loud. And so the first thing then, now that we've got those two things sorted, is to come over to the flight engineers panel. And what I'm going to do is turn battery on. That's fairly self-explanatory, so battery on. I am going to explain a few things to people who are maybe new um, into aircraft flying. So, you know, batteries... Kind of an obvious thing. Almost always in an aircraft, you want to turn that on first. Sometimes you can turn the ground power on first and then the battery, but you know, it's. I just like the flow of battery on. Then you've got this standby power switch, and you see default position off. Um, I like to move that up to the normal. And again, I'm not a stickler for massive long checklists. You know, by all means, knock yourself out doing them. The reason I'm showing you is this way is because despite this video, it is going to be a little bit longer as I explain the various steps. It's going to be much shorter once you've maybe seen it a second time, especially if you're new to the aircraft, in that we're just going to skip over excessively long checklists that, you know, at least in the sim are not required. So let's get the standby power on. And once we do that, we can hear that there's now some noise inside the aircraft. And again, I said uh, Felix has uh, programmed this, and here is, you know, evidence of that. You can see here that the battery is selected, and again, we can just cycle through these to select the different modes. We see that, you know, the different uh, buses, uh, nothing flowing through them, and that's because we've not got anything connected. But we've got the battery, um, the essential, what's uh, TR? Can't think, but just think of that. That's the sort of main one that you want powered when things are all good. You've got your APU battery here. And so let's have a look what these two dials just real briefly mean. Imagine that your DC volts is basically how much charge is in the battery. And then your amps there on the right is how much are you actually getting out of the battery. And so if we come over to the battery page... And uh, we can see currently, what's that? We've got about 23 volts uh, coming. Once that needle hits that little one, we've 20. No, oh no, sorry, we're 26. What am I talking about? 20 is down here. And so, yeah, 26 and a little bit of volts. We can see here we're, we're draining just over 30 amps. And that's because, it, you know, it's powering some of the electrical systems on the plane now. 
and being a rechargeable battery with nothing else that is starting to drain um, I'm just curious can we turn a pump on it would seem not um, so we can't use the battery to directly power the pumps I was just seeing if there was just something we could change to try and demonstrate that a bit more might be used I wonder if it lets us have now that's tripped out how about the electric now okay so again most of these switches on like a, a, a solenoid i think they call them a switch so yeah they're two positions but if they're not supposed to be they can like automatically switch back to the default position and you know that, that those type of switches have been around forever and you still use them today you know perhaps most notably like if the pilot presses disconnect on here um the autopilot switch is automatically going to be disengaged um you know things things of that nature all right so with the battery power established the cover on the standby power into the normal it's now time to connect the ground power and it, it comes with two connections and if you recall if we come outside real quick is actually model this you can see there are physically two plugs going into the aircraft um you, you, what you would maybe call your left and right and um they're they're going to be what we connect first and to verify that it's plugged in and looking good you've got this little um, yellow light here which basically means that there is a connection an AC and that you're alternating current um, if you come over here to your AC meter and again your gen 1234 that's engine 1234 you can see not generating anything clearly because they're off um, APU generator 1 and 2 also not doing anything but if we look here external power 1 and 2 we can see we do have a reading here why well because it's plugged in Although we're not actually got it connected um, into the aircraft electrical system yet. And so to do that, um, you want to move both of these switches up from the off to the close position. And think of it like as a circuit, yeah? Off is like the circuit is open, yeah? There's a gap. And you can see there's like a, a sort of a, a representation here. Like there's a gap in the circuit. And you know, we, we know, right? Electric, it's got a complete circuit in order for it to flow. And so in order to make it flow, you've got to close that gap. So I know some people might prefer an on button or a connect. Um, the way it was back then, it was close for close circuit. Now, once we do that, I'm going to shut up and you can see, observe what happens here and as well to the sound of the aircraft. As I say, see, we've got some amps here. Now we're powering the left side. Now watch what happens when I do the right as well notice that this one came down a bit and this one came up and clearly that's because the aircraft is now sharing its uh, you know the requirements between these two plugs now as we activate more systems we'll see that more amps start to be required now something else of note here look at this battery switch we see here the voltage but look at the amps now instead of it being minus it's actually plus plus about 20 and so some of well, what's happening there well it's literally charging the battery because we've been running on battery for what, two or three minutes whatever it was and in that time we've drained some of the amps and think of it like it's you know it's discharged and whatever percent I'll of the battery it was it's now recharging if you if we were to wait long enough eventually this arrow would drop down to almost if not zero on the amps um, in fact, it's already slightly less. I think it was 20, and by the time it's took me to blab, it's now 19. Okay, now we've got the aircraft um, fully powered electronically, at least, we can start turning things on. A quick way to verify that you've got everything on, um, and again, all of this would be done from the flight engineer station, is to turn his panel on, turn the panel light on. And if you see there, you've got the backlighting behind some of the instruments as I rotate that. If you don't see that backlighting come on, then you know that somewhere along putting power in, you've made a mistake, and that's why there's no backlighting. Another test is that this is lit up. This will light up assuming you've got battery on and the standby on. If you only have the battery on, this won't light up. So it's, um, you know, so the way I like to check is this lit up, 
do I get some backlighting on the on the instruments? And besides, I think the backlighting looks cool even during the day. So I'm always a fan of that. Um, I'm not always a big fan of the backgrounds. Um, if if I'm setting up and it's pitch black, I'll turn it on and then I'll turn it off, usually for the duration of the flight. I do like the uh, overhead circuit breakers as well as the main circuit breakers. We're talking about these panels here and here. And at night, they look really cool, the the, the lighting. I think Felix, again, he's done a fantastic job on um, an awful lot of these systems. And so with that, we're going to leave the flight engineers panel for a bit. We're going to come over to the front of the cockpit and come over to the roof panel. And what uh, the first thing I like to do is get the nav systems aligning. And so in order to pull that off, you first off want to turn on the radio master buses. So think of this as like a power switch for the navigation systems. Doesn't exist in the newer aircraft, but it, for some reason they had a separate switch for the power systems um, for the nav stuff. Uh, as well as I, I assume radios includes communications. I don't know. You've got your essentials and number two. I guess if you've got some sort of power failure, um, you'd leave your essentials on and turn your standby ones off i don't know um at least in my case i've had no cause to do that so we'll turn both of those on and with that uh we can see it's already here we've got our compasses there these little uh, arrows there have already sprung to life and so now i'm going to turn my systems on so uh, i've said this on one of my other videos there is no benefit to moving this switch to the align position and then waiting until it's done and then moving it over to nav because if you move it straight into nav mode what it's going to do is go into the align mode until it's aligned itself unlike the new fmc's and mcdo's that kind of do it automatically for you or pull in a gps and they just want you to click confirm or whatever this system doesn't and you can see there we've got the align a left middle and right the left is my side the right would be your side or the first officers. Uh, the middle one is the flight engineers at the back. Uh, another thing that you may want to do, just, you know, trying to keep things somewhat realistic. Yeah, arm your emergency lights. Um, so what that's going to do is if there's some sort of power failure on the aircraft, the emergency exit lights in the back are automatically going to light up by themselves without anybody else having to do anything. Um... You know, if they lose power suddenly unexpected, there's like a little battery on board them that will now automatically come on. And so that's a switch there to do. Um, and then another one really is you're going to want to put your nav lights on as well as your logo lights. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically it at this stage. Um You've got your main panel background uh, Rio stat here, what they're called, or dial. Um, that's uh, over here. So depending on day, uh, time of day, and I know Explain have been tinkering around with this a lot, but you can see sort of the light there uh, depends how much you're going to need that. And if if it, if it is night time, um, I find that about that is already enough. You've got your overheads here, which is, you know, I like to roll with that full blast uh, unless it's like really dark and then, you know, you can turn that down. But any other time, full blast. And you've got your dome light here. Again, I don't use that at all unless it's really dark and I'm setting up for a little bit and then I'll turn it off. Um, you've got your emergency standby compass here, which you can turn on and off or have it dim. But, you know, re really, I have it off unless I need, I say need it on a... And then uh, another one is you've got your light test here. And again, they're always going to work. But, you know, if you want to do your Christmas tree, there you go. And it's going to stay there, which is helpful. Um, you can have a quick scan round, uh, check that everything is lit up in the manner that you'd expect, um, including your fires here. So that's that. Yeah, and I'm not going to run through all like the fire checks. There's just no point. Uh, we're just trying to... Um, now do the basics and explain what those basics are. Um, yeah, here you've got five buttons, and again, this is just like a bit of fun, really. A uh, one, two, three, four, five. They 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 sort of transmit pre-recorded PA messages. So I'll press number one to give you an idea. Uh, 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. On behalf of the entire crew, welcome aboard the Boeing 747 Classic. We will depart shortly after we have our clearance and the cabin crew is finished with their preparations. Uh, for now, I wish you a pleasant flight and I will be back during the flight with further flight information. Okay, so that's like you're welcome. Um, I believe number two is cabin crew doors to automatic and I believe number three is seats for takeoff and i can't remember what four and five are but must be something to do with the far side maybe coming into land or i don't know but we'll see if i remember to do it um here you've got your seatbelt sign so it's not an up down switch like is more traditional it's actually an on off toggle you've got smoking and seat belts and you've got your flight deck uh, door lock button here um ground crew call if i recall correctly is uh, an access to the pushback although don't quote me on that um and i like to use a hotkey for that regardless but i'll tell you what we will try it and for now let's put the no smoking signs on seeing as that would be procedure uh before you put the seatbelt signs on and you're fueling the aircraft it's a no smoking and no smoking only and then the seatbelt signs go on once the refueling is complete and so for that, let's that is already the phase that we're at. Now, some aircraft require you to have doors and cargo doors open when you reload the aircraft. Um, the Fearless does not, unless he's changed that in the update that I got today. Um, and again, I'm operating on the latest beta as of 13th of Feb 2023. Um, so if you want to open it, uh, you can open it. Uh, the... Gangway is compatible with X-Plane 12, so if you press your Shift G, um, you can toggle your gateway here. It'll automatically hook up with the uh, front uh, door there of, of the aircraft, you know, for the, for the people that like the graphics. If you've got your ground handling um, thing, which is a bit of a pay where that automatically connects up and people drive to the appropriate positions. Um, and again, all of that is optional. Doesn't really serve any function other than is nice, you know, if you're doing your streams or your screenshots and or videos or whatever, you, you know, you can use that and that's all working nicely. Okay. Um, as we said, this system does not auto align. And so that's what we're going to do first. And so coming over here, um, if I bring Avi tab, um, our departure here is uh, San Juan um, or San Juan. Um, and the IKO there, TJSJ, Tango, Juliet, Sierra, Juliet. And that's going to be accurate enough for a quick start. So we're just going to put in TJSJ. You can knock yourself out and put the entire um, coordinates into this system. And certainly if you're using this system to basically force yourself down an RNAV, not that you can load an RNAV uh, arrival or departure in, but you can basically manually force yourself waypoint by waypoint to do that RNAV departure, um, then you'd need to be a bit more precise. But TJSJ is going to suffice uh, for our flight today. Oh, by the way, I did, I did just want to finish off on the lighting. Uh, you've got your panel light in here. Um, so the fatter of the two dials controls uh, the captain's side. So if we spin that and um, there, you can see it. Uh, same story over here, the fatter of the two. And then uh, we've got the panel here, which is for your autopilot. And that's just controlled over there. Uh, to clear out the MCs, you just click on this and that is going to clear them out like so and then finally last but not least we've got two dials here uh, one of them is for the lighting on here and the other one is for the engine instrumentation so if we turn this one uh, full turn that one full see we've got now uh, it's kind of hard to see in the daylight but you know trust me it's there and you can certainly see uh, we're lit up on there now so that's uh, certainly all working all right so we've said tjsj these things won't start aligning until we've programmed that in. Fearless has now added the option that you can directly type into these systems using your keyboard. In order to do that, you see these little orange dots here. You got to click on them. Now, ordinarily, right, as you can see here, there's five lines and that's the most there's ever going to be. Five lines of text from top to bottom. The, the middle line, or which is indicated by these orange dots, is only ever the line that you can edit. And so if you want to, let's, I mean, clearly this is just like a welcome screen, but let's just say PGM was a waypoint or whatever. If we wanted to edit that, we'd have to use these arrow keys to move the screen up or down. 
until PGM and whatever was in the middle. So here we can see that the latest Dirac cycle. So it's uh, uh, January 2023 as I'm making this video. And so cycle 2301 makes sense. Okay, so let now you can just use the buttons and click on them so you can clear like this. Or you can also click on these orange ones. Be aware, now that the keyboard has got focus, don't forget that is the case. And so don't start trying to use hotkeys or type things and wonder why is my keyboard not working. In order to, to come away, what you need to do is either hit your uh, escape button or click on the orange dot again so it stops flashing. And clearly this is just a little hack, if you like, that Fearless has added because um, sometimes it's a lot easier to type than to, you know, search for the letter. Especially sometimes it can be a bit confusing, such as here you think, is it a U or is it an R? Um, is this an N or an E? And of course, you know, those of you, you've probably already seen it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J in alphabetical. And then the only reason there's some more letters here is the North, South, East, West. And here you've got left and right as well. And so location ID, and we'll have a little closer look at it when we go over to the other side. But uh, now let me just type this in my keyboard. So I'm going to put T, J, S, J. And I'm going to hit enter. Now I've got to confirm the time and the date. And so is it eight minutes past five in the evening GMT? Yes, because I've got a custom time. Is it the 13th of February 2023? Um, actually, yeah, that is today's date. So I guess the new Iraq cycle due out any moment. And so with that now, we've aligned. Now I'm going to focus on that a little more carefully on this second one. And so here's your welcome screen once you've got your system powered up and in the align mode. And so first off, we've got clear to continue. So let's hit clear. And then here is either your lat long or your location ID. So if you want to put your lat long, you'd hit now and you'd put in north, whatever, or south or, you know, and then east and west. But again, for brevity's sake, let's scroll down. And again, it's the Airbus style of scrolling. So look at this. And I want to... Imagine this screen is a piece of paper. And so if 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 you if you want to get the orange dot in between the location ID, initially you'd be forgiven thinking, well, I need it to go up. I need the orange dot to go up, but you're not moving the orange dot. You're moving the screen as though it's a piece of paper. So to get lock ID in between the orange dots, you would have to move your piece of paper down. Yeah, imagine, you know, I need to pull this down somehow because the orange dots are going to stay still. And so down, that's how you do it. Kind of like scrolling your finger on a on an iPhone or whatever. You know, you, you pull the page in the direction you want to go. Um, it's just the way that computers used to be. The arrows worked the other way on. And I know uh, sometimes, especially for us older folk, you, you get it mixed up sometimes. So yeah, that's for us. Um, and so now let's just, to demonstrate, you can use this as well. Uh, TJS j and enter now that's in as well confirm the time confirm the date i've never found a reason that the, t that the time and date is wrong but again if you want to be you know real precise uh you know you'd confirm it you've got a time here gmt 1710 and so that's in agreement there um coming down here same again and if again if you've got live time and everything um you know that that should match up with your actual time anyway um, the only reason I'm not doing lifetime is that where we are would be pitch black and I just want uh, some daylight at least for now. So same again for the flight engineers. So clear, scroll down, location ID, uh, T, J, S, J, enter, confirm the time, confirm the date, and that's it. Now the systems are aligning. If we come over to the uh, status page here, STS, you can actually see how long it reckons to take. You've got an align code there. You just saw it maybe jump from 50 to 10. And it reckons it's about 5.2 minutes to the alignment completes. That's for this system here. If we come over to the first, uh, to the captains, simply because we did this one first, you can see there's only 2.4 minutes uh, to go on that one. Okay, so with that out the way, um, let's take a look at the flight plan. Now, as far as I'm aware, um, adding weight, fuel, cargo, whatever, doesn't upset the alignment process. And again, not sure if at some point Fearless uh, may or may not change that, but at least for now, and I don't know if it's also a limitation from X-Plane, because I don't know any aircraft where adding fuel or whatever upsets your uh, 
nav alignment process. Um, and again, we're just going to loosely follow this flight plan. Um, so if I scroll over to page three, just to get my loadout page, um, and whoa, I'm just going to go off the payload total. So 79,600 pounds. I like to operate in pounds. Um, um, so 79.6. And if we look at the fuel, bang on 50. Well, that's nice and easy. Again, this is in brief profile. I didn't plan it like that, but at least I should be able to remember it. So let's just, for, for simplicity's sake, payload 80 and the fuel on 50. And so the way to insert that, you, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. I think there's actually three ways. You can come over to the load calculator and you can come over to any of these numbers that you want to change cargo on and just uh, spin your mouse wheel over the one that you want to change. Um, you've got some preset options down here for passengers and cargo. And again, same for your fuel. You just twizzle the mouse wheel. Um, the second option is using the refuel and payload menus. And then finally, you've got a fast load option here, which is just a real quick down and dirty way of doing both in, in one shot. Um, let's come to the refuel page. We see currently we've got 351,000 pounds of fuel on board. There, that is not normal, but the reason is because I was doing something crazy the last time I flew, whenever it was. Um, and so what you want to do is set your total fuel to what you need. Now, we know the total fuel for our flight plan was £50,000. So you want to have at least that. You may want to put a little more in. And you can see, because we've actually got this much in, um, the tablet's saying that we actually need to drain £301,000 because we've got three hundred and fifty-one to reach this. Now, that makes sense. And then you've got the option here to call a tanker to do it. And then you've got to wait for it to drain down. Or you can do this one and it'll be like instant. And so I think what I'm going to do is just put a couple of thousand uh, extra in just to allow me. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll go for 60 just to allow me a bit of time if I need to explain something or whatever. And I'm just going to hit instant refuel so we can get this thing started. Now, I don't know if you caught that. There was a bit of an aircraft jolt. And that's because we just basically lot shed like 100 tons of weight in one instantaneous press. Um, the aircraft jolted around. Has it upset? And it looks like, no, it hasn't upset this system. Alignment. That one, now, once you get this code one, uh, nav code one, that basically means not only is it ready, but it's up and running. And if we come up to the top, you can see then the align light has gone out. It's still there for the first officers. It's still there for the flight engineers. And that's because he's still got about a minute to go. And uh, flight engineer 1.7. Now, clearly, you need to wait for all three to align before you can move. But by the time you've done the other stuff, it's going to be there. Um, so and now we'll, so that's the fuel done. We've done that instantly. So now we're going to come over to the payload. And again, same again. Now, you, you can get creative with, well, how many people? And you can take a look here. What's that going to do to the weight? Um, so let's try and ball it for 50,000. So what have we got? Zero fuel. Uh, 387 let's call it so we're going to need about 437 or thereabouts so let's put people on thankfully Phyllis lets you really flick your mouse wheel around um, so 437 so I'm going to go with 232 and that is basically my 50,000 uh, give it uh, so oh no it was 80 wasn't it that we were taking and so there's 50 let's put 30,000 on cargo and now now we're going to have 80,000 as quick as that and again the same options you can board and that's a very gradual and it takes quite a long time in the sim to load 232 passengers much quicker to load uh, cargo um and I'll, if i just press load there you can see how it's loading i'm not going to do the same for the people because it does take quite a long time uh, so i think what i'm going to do is just press instant board and there we go um adds some crew on as well which may slightly throw off your numbers versus the sim brief because the sim brief, as far as I'm aware, doesn't automatically put crew on. You know, the sim brief is going to give you passengers and cargo, but it's not going to dynamically change how many crew you have based on those numbers. Um, so you may wish to tinker with either cargo weights if you want, or if you're a right stickler uh, for the weights. But basically, uh, 10 people or 12 people either way on a 747 is, is not going to be noticeable really in the grand scheme of things. But again, it, it just depends how accurately you like to be there. Okay, so next thing, let's have a little look then at our flight plan. Um, so I've deliberately chosen a short route. And if I scroll down here, you can see a visual 
uh, representation. So if you imagine you've got the US over here, you've sort of got Florida right around there, Miami area, you've got Guantanamo Bay down here, you've got South America down here, and then ways over here, you've got the uh, Atlantic Ocean, basically. I mean, we're already in it, really, but, you know, the Atlantic Ocean over here, and on this kind of zoom, maybe you've got Spain or UK somewhere around there, if we, if we were to imagine that. Okay, so it's a relatively short flight, TJSJ, as we know as our departure, TNCM or St. Martin, that you know, the, the, the famous, you know, unfortunately, I don't think the 7.4s go there anymore. But, you know, you used to get those dramatic shots. The KLM 747s coming in and landing there. And um, so you can see we've got very few waypoints. Thankfully, we're going to be able to program those in. So let's come. Well, that's where I wanted to be, just not on that page. Um, so I'm going to scroll up to page four. And that's going to give me my route. So here's the departure. Um and I'm not going to even try and butcher the name of the uh, airfield, but it's at San Juan anyway. Now, they're giving us, a SID here, the Jets Sierra 1 um, departure. Now, again, I don't think legally you can do anav departures on this, but you can basically knock yourself out putting all the waypoints in. Just make real sure you adhere to the speed and the height restrictions if you do that, especially if you're on VATS, you know, if you're just doing it by yourself like we are today. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, it is possible to do, and I have done a tutorial on that. It's just extremely um, task saturatingly intensive. And if you like that sort of thing, and it can be fun to do, go for it. Just if it's a busy airspace, just be really sure you're confident on doing it. What we're going to do now, and you can do this while the systems are still aligning, is we're going to come over to the waypoint page, WPT. And think of this as a bit like your legs page or your route page in the uh, FMCs or, or the McDo's. Um, and we can copy this over. So it's not something that you have to repeat on all three. You do have to repeat the initial alignment, which we've done, and that's it. And so waypoint zero is always going to be your present position and we see that here indicated with the p and the chevrons and that changes and so let's say in an hour we're flying at wherever it is that position wherever that is is also going to be known as waypoint zero so that's a crucial thing to understand don't think oh if i go back to waypoint zero it'll take me back to base no waypoint zero will be where you are at that time um and so let's take a look here now you may want to take a look at uh, uh again because we've been given the jets one departure here by Simbrief. you may want to look at that now i perhaps should have done it ahead of time but uh let's just do it now so airports tjsj and let's have a little look what the jets uh, one departure is now this depends you know do you have access to this page depends whether you've got a navigraph subscription or not uh, it's nothing to do with Fearless's plane. And I'm just going to see, uh, are we going to be able to do this? Well, this looks a relatively straightforward departure. Um, it's a takeoff um, and then either 280 or 060 after takeoff, depending on which way we go. Um, and then it's uh, straight on to jets. Now we can put jets in. And um, so I'm satisfied that we can do this one. So let's go with the jets one departure. Um, looks like a very simple departure as well. Um, and I assume the point at when you turn from departure heading on to jets is dependent on when ATC tells you, hey, 7-4 classic proceed direct to jets. Or, yeah. And I'm sure if we read that somewhere, that's exactly what it's going to say. Yeah. So basically, turn left, head in, da, da 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 for vector to intercept, and then here's a radial towards jets. Um, and so that's actually a 080 from Zan Yuan. And um, so, yeah, it's basically saying you'll at some point get a vector to intercept jets here. So that's going to be our first waypoint, J-E-T-S-S. -S. But if we come over to the charts now that we've decided, yeah, we're definitely doing this on our departure, come back to the charts page, what do you know? Our first waypoint is J-E-T-S-S. -S. And so in this case, Simbrief has given us the... It always gives you the waypoints for the SID 
and the star if it gives you one anyway. The only reason I just don't blindly copy the whole thing is it depends. Has it given you a SID and a star that you're capable of doing? Now, if, if SIDs and stars, you're thinking, what on earth is that? Don't worry about it. Just it's the standard departure plate that you're going to be given from almost any airport in the world. It's certainly that handles commercial traffic and the arrivals at the far side. They're just basically a series of predefined pre-agreed waypoints that every aircraft on a given day has to fly depends on which way the wind's blowing um, to make sure that they're, all the arrivals and departures deconflict the entire time without the controller having to do anything. They basically just sequence the aircraft at the, you know, to make sure the runway has good use and, you know, that not everybody's trying to land at once. Um, and they do that by asking people to speed up, slow down and take shortcuts. That's, you know, and that's basically the trick there. All right, so let's get on with this. So we've got Jet SS or Jets S or let's just call it Jets. Um, surely on the radio, that's what it would be pronounced. And so again, I'm just going to click on the orange dot here to give me access. And I'm typing, why isn't it working? Because I need to enter for the first line. So I'm going to hit enter. Now you see the dots. We've got this little A here. That means alpha, alphas as in alphabets. If it's N November or there's an N, that means numbers. That means instead of, for instance, pressing this, you'd get an E, you're going to get a 1. You're going to get a 2 instead of an F. You're going to get a 3 instead of a G. And again, you just press that to shift over between the two. So let's go with the letter A to begin with, because your alphas we need to type. And I'm going to type it in J-E-T-S-S. Enter. Now that's the first waypoint in, and it automatically scrolls down to waypoint 2. Now, in order that we don't all twist our heads, what I'm going to do is bring my, where are we here, Avitab tablet on here, and I'm just going to copy it from there. Now, this, again, is basically a copy of what we see here, and there you can see. Now, we've got two other waypoints here, um, a TOC and a TOD. Now, that because there's a space in between, we know that means that's the top of climb and that's the top of descent. Now, it's a short uh, route, and so, you know, these aren't actually waypoints per se. They're just advisories. Hey, this is where the top of the climb is. This is where the top of the descent is. Now, if we were to want to put these points in, now, normally you wouldn't, but let's just say you wanted to, you would have to create a custom waypoint and then enter these coordinates here. Of course, there's no guarantee that this actually will be your top of climb and this will be your top of descent. It's just Simbrief's best guess. Um, and again, if you want to make custom waypoint, all that you need to do is enter a fix that doesn't exist. And the easiest way to that is to put in a six letter fix. Um, so let, for example, say um, C U S T. And then let's say N for number. Um, Actually, let's keep it on letters and say C-U-S-T for custom, and I'm just going to go A-A. Now, again, you can pick any six-letter thing that doesn't already exist. I'm fairly sure that won't exist. If I enter, instead of it accepting it, it's going to say, well, where do you mean lat long? And again, lat is always going to be first. That's your north, south. Long is always second. That's your east, west. Now, if you ever forget, and I used to forget which way around, think of it like this. Lat is like a ladder, and a ladder would take you up and down. So that's your north, south. And long is like, well, how long is it to get around the world? And how do you get around the world where you'd either go east or west? And at least that's my little way of remembering it. If you've got your own way, um, you know, <laughs> maybe share it with us. Um, or maybe you just think, that's stupid. I can just remember it. You don't need somebody to stand on your left foot in order to remember which way left and right is. And no. But anyway, that's the way I do it. So, yeah, so lat long. So, again, I'm just going to put one of these in just to demonstrate. So, your lat there. And again, I'm just going to click that orange dot to type it in a bit quicker. Um, so, start with... Um, north. Actually, that didn't let me type in the N, I don't think. So, yeah, north there to get your N. And again, that's, you know, tallies with this. Um, and then I'm going to switch over here. I'm actually going to type this to demonstrate. So we're here, here we see the N. So we know we're going to use the numbers now. And it's 18382. 18382. Now take a look at this. It doesn't look entirely the same. 
What's really important is this match is on the front. Now notice there's a point two at the back. Well, there's a point, well, two, eight. And so this here is not the same. Because if we look at what this is really, it's ignore where the point is. Look at the numbers in front. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4. And so this is actually north 18, not north 1. And so even though it's got the right amount of numbers, there's actually two numbers after the point here at the end. Here we've only got one, we've, or two digits. We've got a point 2. Here we've got a point 82. And so what we need to do is move all of these numbers one further to the left. Now what number do you put in? Well, I'm just going to put in a 0. And so now if we take a look, now it's 1838.2. Yeah, point 20 is the same as point 2. 1838.2. And so that is now in agreement. Now there is a way that you can check after all the waypoints are in. If one of the distances, instead of being like 20 miles or 50 miles, is like 3000 miles, it's like, well, well, that's a bit of a jump between one waypoint and the next. And so there are sort of ways that you can check. And so with that in, let's uh, enter, and now it's longitude time. Again, east-west. Now what's really important when you get the long is, like with the lat, only long has three numbers. And again, the easiest way to remember this is long is always longer. So lat only ever has two numbers on the front. Whether it's north or south, it goes up to 90 degrees. Yeah, well really it's going to go up to 89 point whatever. You know, technically it could get up to 90 degrees, which would be right on the pole. Longitude goes all the way to 180 degrees, both east and west. And so that's why there's three digits. Now let's say, like in this case, we're just 65 degrees to the west. You need to make sure that either there's a zero or an underscore on the front. Yeah, so it's not 650 west, it's not 6 west, it's 65 west, then the degrees. So 65 degrees and then minutes and seconds and whatnot. So make sure it's correct. And again, we can see here there's only one digit after the decimal point. We can see here it's asking for two. So make sure you put a zero in. So what I'm just, some people say you don't need to type in the leading zero. I get it. I'm going to do it anyway. And so let's start with the worth for West or, or the whiskey for West. W. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I was speaking like a kid there. 065084. Um, and again, here we can see, don't make the mistake. This here would be 6 West, 6 degrees, 50 minutes and 84 seconds West. That's not correct. It's 6508. And again, the big giveaway, 0 0.4, not 0.84. So again, we add a 0, 65, 0, 8, 4, 65, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 4. So that is now in. Okay, now we've got here, double check that. Is that what you want to use? Yes. And now the option is not enter. Be aware, it's clear to reject this one or expand to use. This is your expand button here, EXP. So we're going to press expand. And now our cust AA is our waypoint two. Okay, so let's try and proceed a little quicker now. So I'm going to click here. And uh, we've got Slugo next. And then we've got a VOR there at St. Martin, which is a PJM. So let's put that in PJM. And then, even though it's basically going to be the same place, we've actually got the end destination. I always like to put the airport IKO as my very last waypoint, whether there's a VOR there or not, just because... That way, if, if the worst happens and you get a bit disorientated, your final waypoint is going to take you towards the airport, unless you've completely screwed up the alignment process. So let's go with TNCM. OK, and with that, we're done. So again, I'm going to click here to get my keyboard back. And with that now done, uh, the easiest way to exit this is to, the way I find, come over to the ends and then just change the mode here. Otherwise, it will start typing in a new line, starting with the letter A, and you don't want that. And so now we've got the different menus. And so there we're done. And so what you're going to want to do next is, and again, if we view the waypoints here and scroll, we see it's basically one through five, so a very short route. If you've got more waypoints in, believe me, you won't want to type that in triplicate. So if we come over to the waypoints here, we see there are none. And so to copy those over, um, you need to come over to the RMT, which stands for remote. 
and change whichever system you have typed the waypoints in. It's often going to be the captain's side. Um, you want to change to X fill master or cross fill master. So we're going to scroll to cross fill master, press enter once, and then we're going to wait. We're then going to come over to the other systems, come over to remote, and you guessed it, cross fill slave, enter. And then we're going to come down to the flight engineers and do the same remote cross fill slave enter and now when we come back to the captain's system see it's getting ready to send five waypoints enter to select okay and now you can see captains who is system a says system b is ready so that's this one and system c is ready and again that's uh this one and so just to demonstrate this if if i press clear here to come out you can see system B is now not ready. So again, come over to Crossfield Slave, enter, it's ready, and then enter to KMIT or transmit. And so you'll do that. And it takes about one second per waypoint. And again, so five, so, you know, if you've got 30 waypoints, it's going to take 30 seconds. But believe you me, that's quicker than typing out 30 waypoints three times. And so now Crossfield complete. If we come over to the waypoint page, we can see those are indeed in. And uh, the page that I like to be on generally um is a legs page across the board on all three systems and and uh, and that's because once you're in the air you're going to want to tell the system to align to basically go to the next way it doesn't automatically know it wants you to go from where you are to the next waypoint you need to tell it right from where i am now to the next waypoint yes we could tell it to go from here to the next waypoint but literally we don't want to go from here to the next waypoint we want to take off following the instructions on the departure page and then at some point atc is going to tell us hey 74 classic go to jets when atc says that that is the time we want to tell it hey now start your whole legs thing and the way that you do that with legs page activated is just press enter enter twice and you'd want to do that on all three systems and so you want the legs page sat ready and waiting again there's no speeds and decision speeds and altitudes to put into this thing weights or anything it's a two-dimensional navigation system and so that's fine to be left as is okie doke so with all of that done the aircraft loaded up it's time to get the apu started um so let's come up top and put the signs on we're going to lock the cockpit door going to come back here and we're going to start the APU and so this is a two-step process a little bit like the Airbuses um, so the first thing you're going to want to do is click it I know it says the down position but it actually moves it to the on position and what you want to do is wait until this APU door goes dim and that's basically it's opening up the external doors and there now we can start the APU something else you'll notice is this light seems like it's not working this number two tank once you've got the APU on and that's because whether you have the switch on or not it's going to override your decision and use that fuel pump to pump fuel into the APU and so now I'm just going to put it a start I'm going to hold it there for a second or two let go and there we go we've now caught that up it's actually a very fast at starting um I'm not sure if it was really this quick, but uh, certainly it would seem to be one of the fastest APUs. And you can see it's already starting to settle and RPM is basically 100% already. And to confirm that it is ready, if you come over here to the APU Gen 1 and 2, you can see here based on the frequencies, it's ready. The reason a voltage is basically reading zero is it's waiting for us to connect it to the aircraft power for now we're still powering the aircraft from the ground um, and so that's now ready to do before you change over to the APU from the ground make sure that all your align lights are out you don't want to interrupt and swap the power source over while this alignment is taking place we can clearly see all of those systems are out and so this is now ready to go and so we're going to come over here and when we close the APU circuit and then close this second one, which uh, you'll watch this automatically kick off. So close, that's the APU generator now functional. And if we come over here to 
APU Gen 1 there we can see the voltage is on APU is still off because we've not yet closed that one so we can do that there as well um, now APU 1 and 2 are on now we can close the circuit and as soon as I do this it's going to automatically kick power off so the ground power so watch this on and same for the other side close and now we've replaced the ground power with our own power All right, so now AP, our own APU, our auxiliary power unit, is powering both sides of the aircraft. You can see we've got two generators. Now, I've always been unsure, is there actually two separate APUs that are both powered using the one APU system? Or is it like a slightly bigger APU that's just got two generators attached on the same shaft, if you like? Um, I don't know. Um, I find it strange that you'd have one control for two separate APUs if there really was two separate APUs in any case. it's uh, Just think of it as one APU, but it's got two generators attached to it. If it is two separate APUs, they may as well just be one. I mean, we see we've got single indications here, so my suspicion is it's just one. Um, all right, so with that, um, next thing you're going to want to do is get the APU bleed on. And... Uh, I, I please forgive me those of you that already know the sequence here um this is just to get everybody onto the same page the apu if we come outside by the way this sounds loads better i really like that apu sound vast improvement and so as you can see there apu is this little hole here it looks a bit like a bum hole of a plane right let's be honest um in the tail there is there's like a little hidden jet engine if you like but it doesn't produce any thrust despite it looking like it should produce thrust based on all that hot exhaust it doesn't what it does do is provide power for the aircraft electrically as well as bleed air now what is bleed air it may, just think of it as like as an air compressor and with an air compressor, you can either you, you either choose to let it run idly, kind of like it is now, or you can choose to steal some of that air and direct that air where you want it to go somewhere else in the plane. And when you pinch air, whether it's from this engine here or from one or more of the main engines, pinching that air is known as bleed air. And so what in, in real life, what you'll have is a, a jet engine that's got umpteen compressor stages. I don't know whether it's 20 or who knows, but, you know, it's going to vary from the different types of engines. But let's assume there's 20 different stages, um, you know, and it's it's going to it's going to depend roughly on how many blades that there are and, and through the inside. And what it's going to do is every 20th cycle as, as so every every time the fans spin let's just say there's 20 every 20th fan or it might be number 12 out of 20 so every 12th fan even though there's 20 all together so it still wants every rotation that one fan instead of producing thrust the air is going to be pinched it's going to be bled away from the engine and it's going to supply something else. So what is that something else? Well, the main reason is to pressurize the cabin as well as either warm it up or cool it down if it's in summer. And the system that does the pressurization and the warming and the cooling is known as the PAX. And that's the same for all aircraft, whether it's new, old, whether it's Boeing or Airbus, they're known as the PAX. And so if we come inside back to the flight engineers panel, the packs are controlled. Uh, well, this here is the bleed panel. Um, so this is, you know, we're going to pin share from the engines one, two, three, four. And and then these are your pack switches here. And um, these switches here just basically let you pin share, let's say, from the right engine and feed it through to the left side of the aircraft. If, you know, if there was some sort of engine failure or, or you were doing some sort of cross bleed start or whatever. In any case... Um, for now, we just want the packs. And so take a look at this. This little instrument here is what's known as the duct pressure. So what that means is how much air pressure is there inside the system? And again, you can get air pressure from any of the five different places, the four different engines and your little APU that we've got running in the tail. You can actually also get duct pressure 
from a from an external air source in um in some situations i'm not sure if that's simulated on this aircraft let's have a little look ground and it looks like um at least so far it is not simulated i'm not seeing it but it, again it's like it's only really used in the extreme cases like you've got an apu bleed failure and anyways by the by i'm trying i'm over complicating things just think of it as the air pressure inside now in this is clearly reading zero well, why is it zero when we've got the apu up and running we've seen it's up and running because we've not turned the bleed on here we see it's closed so as you know we know the apu is up and running that's all fine we can see here rpm is 100 the egt is going we can see here it's powering the aircraft and we can see here you know the generators are all up and running um so what we're going to do now is turn the bleed air on now as soon as i flick this switch watch what happens to the duct pressure here i'll try and capture both turn the sound up a bit and so there you can see the duct pressure and so again we're pinching that compressed air that so far was just all getting chucked out the back of the plane and now some of that is being used to to basically um, pressurize our bleed air system and again it's you don't just use the bleed air to provide air for the cabin packs you know that pressurize the cabin provide it keep it warm or cool the, the it's also used to start the engines and some people have a bit of a well how do jet engines actually start is there a little electric motor in there that gets it going and then the jet takes over no actually the bleed air what it does is it literally blows onto the engines and so we're going to pinch the air that's been generated at the back of the aircraft here let me turn that down a bit so i don't feel like i've got a shout over it so we're pinching some of the air that's been generated by this thing we're redirecting it through the wing and let's say we're starting this engine first it's literally going to blow that air on that engine that engine is going to start spinning and once it's spinning at a certain speed we add fuel in and then the jet engine starts its own cycle that you know continues for as long as there's fuel and that then supplies its own self and then we just simply redirect the bleed air to start all of the other engines and so that's the process that we're going to do um any moment now so before that we do that one other thing um you know let's just get the air packs on i'm kind of trying to explain a lot here because again it's like a full tutorial um despite it being a brief thing so what <laughs> i say just the briefest number of button pushes but i'm explaining them to the fullest extent so that you're not just blindly copying what button do i press in what order and no idea why you're pressing them and so with the bleed air there we're going to turn the packs on now you've got three packs and you've got a half and a full setting here are your three packs one two three at the moment they're all off and so let's start um with pack number one which is on the left so we'll turn that to the half setting and now you can see there's air flowing through the system if we take a look here's the temperature as well as the and it so this is actually the air um, as it flows into the pack the reason it's so hot is because well it's coming out of a jet engine that's in the tail the, the air conditioning system in the pack is cooling it down and is actually letting it into the aircraft in this case we can see roughly around 20 21 degrees something like that and that's based on these settings here now here's the aircraft temperatures currently up 24 25 degrees those temperatures do change dynamically it's probably because we're in quite a warm part of the world right now and we can for instance dial these down now look what's just happened there notice that as i change the temperature there the temperature that the pack is asking for is being changed clearly because i'm trying to cool the aircraft down um, and i just find the default temperature would be far too hot anyway and um, so i'm going to turn them to the 11 o'clock position sort of across the board and i'm also going to turn the trim air on so what's the trim air switch all it basically does is it automatically puts a little bit more heat or a little bit less heat into the different parts of the aircraft to allow for just just basically the, the best way to explain it is that 
as the air comes in through the system it's going to be imagine like you've got a big old house and you've got one heater and that heater is sending hot water through like a pipe that's like really really long by the far by the time that pipe gets to the far side of the house the hot water is no longer going to be as hot as it was at the beginning of the house and so although you're trying to keep all the radiators on at the same temperature the exact temperature of each room is going to depend you know in what order is it first come first served um and what individual temperature have you got set for the individual compartments on the plane trim air basically uses some clever trickery to try and negate all of those problems and so as soon as you've got the packs on unless there's a very specific reason not to i'd always turn trim air on and that's basically going to try and balance this out um and so yeah that's what that one does um now if we come to pack two we can still see it's off and three is off but again this is attention to detail from Felix. i just want to point out and so with pack one on we can see currently using about 20 um cubic feet per minute times 100 so basically 2000 cubic feet a minute of air going into the system through pack one now if we turn pack two to full watch what happens notice there's now less air going through pack one so why would that be well it's because we've got one little jet engine feeding all three packs and pack one is on half that's how much but if we start pinching more air from that duct that is you know there's just one duct there's less air left for the rest of it and so that's what's going on there now clearly if we go to pack two and we do the same thing we can see actually overall there's now more air going through and that's confirmed by how loud we can hear the air now this is the most amount of air that we can get off one apu you can see it's just shy of 20 of uh, 2000 cubic feet per pack so i'm gonna what i'm gonna do is set them all down to half just for now Okie doke, so that's in. Let's come over here to the ground panel and I'm going to disconnect the ground power the ground. unit. Disconnect ground power. Now we've got the sounds and I'm also going to remove the chocks. Cockpit to ground, remove the chocks. Kind of important because the better pushback mod doesn't do that and you can get some nasty surprises. Ground make power disconnected. Make sure all your doors are closed. You know, if one was open, that's what you'd chocks see. Removed. So it's relatively straightforward wait until the amber light goes out now you're good to go everything open everything white that you know if everything says open and it's white that means you're good to go and same with the cargo doors here okie doke so i'm just gonna get um which runway are we expecting for departure It's runway 08, so I'm just going to confirm that with the ATIS. So I'm going to come over to my airports page, TJSJ, just come over to the airport 10.9. They're not really aircraft specific. ATIS uh, 125.8, let's see if we can hear anything. Uh, we'll use this one, 125.8. Make sure you move this switch to, you know, activate the light that you want. And then this one here being VHF2, make sure you turn the volume dial up full. Now, as long as it's going to work at some point. Information, Yankee, 1745, Zulu, wind, 1, 2, 0, degrees, at 11. Visibility, more than 10. So that's working fantastic. So let's grab that. View at 6,000. Temperature, 26. Dew point, 20. Altimeter two nine nine four. Arrive at runway one zero. Departing runway zero eight. Advise on initial contact you have. Information Yankee two nine nine four. Okay, departing runway zero eight. So let's see what that heading Set is. Information zero Yankee. seven eight seventeen forty five. Zulu wind one two zero degrees at eleven knots. Visibility more than ten miles. Sky conditions few at three thousand. Few at. Six. I'm just gonna grab the winds. Temperature twenty six. Dew point twenty. Altimeter two nine nine four. Arrive at runway one zero. I'll tell you what, will I'll show, grab it another way. That that'll do. So 
We know it's this one for departure, so I'm just going to, again, match the heading 078 on the heading panel on there, the autopilot. Um, and I'm even going to put it on the course on my side. And then just because I'm going to try and do this properly, I'm going to see if I've got an ILS for my side. Um, you can only put two nav beacons on this one and there's no standby switch. Again, as the real life, so you can't switch between this one and a standby one. And the same for the first officer. You've just got the two radios, uh, the radio VORs or your ILSs, and that's it. Um, and so where possible, I like to mix and match, unless, of course, you're doing a Cat 3 ILS, in which case you need to tune them both in. So let's have a look for approach. ILS 08, we do indeed have a frequency, and it's 1030. Um, so let's dial that in on my side. 10.30, is it being picked up yet? Well, it would seem not yet, but, you know, we're a little ways away from the airport. And so now I'm going to decide something. Now, we've got a very useful NDB. Look at this here, Patty 330. Now, you can dial those in independently. If we come back here, that's this one. Um, so this one's the nearest. So let's just go... 330 and if you look carefully you've got three separate dials stacked atop of each other fat middle and thin and those correspond to whichever digit you want to move if you spin the thin one round it's just going to go round and round and round so you know make sure you pick the right one and again here you do have a standby interestingly enough and same for the first officer so i'm going to do the same trick over here uh, 330 and then if I should suddenly need to take a look at the ADFs, I can switch this panel from VOR over to the ADF quick as that. And based on this chart, it's more or less going to bring me in line with where I need to be to come into land. Okay, so 10.30. Now your side, I could tune in San Juan there, 140 VOR. Um, if we take another look in the area maps page, Come over to your cog, overlay the VORs. Um, so there's San Juan, again, 114.0. If I zoom out, I'm going to look for a different one. Um, we've got STT over here. Uh, that may be useful. Uh, we've got this one here, uh, 1380. You know what? Let's just tune that one in for the sake of it. 113.80. Uh, so 113. 80 for no other reason than it's just a different VOR. Um, so those are now both tuned in um, and neither it would seem a receiving and that's probably because we're on the ground. Even though we are close enough, we just don't have line of sight. Okay, so let's have a look then for our departure and we'll be underway um, in just a minute or so. So to do, again, I'm trying to do it somewhat properly. Avitab airports page. Coming over to the departure page, it's this one here. Actually, I should have changed this. It's based on the San Juan VOR 080 to Jets. So I'm actually going to set that to 14.0. I just reminded myself of that, having seen that. And now, indeed, we are picking that up. You can see 0 0.8 miles and uh, the double arrow... Uh, points to your beacon and just think you know the double arrow is VOR2 you know VOR2 is your side VOR1 is my side which is the single arrow and my side um, isn't pointing anywhere nor is it gonna because I've actually got an ILS tuned up but uh, I may or may not get distance measuring with that just depends if the ILS is set up for that usually they are uh, you see here, we're, after we're supposed to get to jets on this 080 radial out of San Juan, so we'll set that up on your side as well. So again, we've got San Juan VOR set up here. And so of course on your side, I'm going to set to 080. Now bearing in mind, my side is set for runway heading 078 as well as the ILS. Your side is for the uh, intercept, but we can see... Irrespective of all of that, after takeoff, we're to turn left to 060. So that is like a memory item. We've got nowhere else to plug it into. Uh, so we'll just be aware of that. Um, so let's have another look now. Do we have an altitude to climb to? Uh, we see here transition alt is at 18,000. So that's pretty standard for the US. Um, and it would seem... Altitude maintain 5,000 unless assigned a lower altitude. So our initial climb 
per the Sid is up to 5,000. So we'll put that one in there. Okie doke. With that done, the only thing that remains then is to get the takeoff speed and we can push back. So homepage, performance calculation, we're on the takeoff page. If you want to get to the landing, hit that. Back to the takeoff, hit that. So it basically, if it says landing, that means you're on the takeoff page and you press there to get to the landing page, not that you're on the landing page. Um, so what you can do is use your middle mouse wheel and set this as well as your CG appropriately, or you can click on read data from, and you've got a choice between either the load sheet or the SIM. To save time, I'm going to just click on SIM and that's going to get the exact figures from the SIM and that's going to be correct. Now you've only got two choices for takeoff in the 7.4. It's a flaps 10 or a flaps 20. I think that same choice exists to this day with the Dash 8. Although sad to see the last one rolling off the factory just two or three months ago. But I'm going to go with flaps 20 because that's pretty standard. Now here we got some airport information. The first bit is with respect to the airport itself. How long's the runway? How high? The heading? Uh, the slope? And then the second part is what's the weather? And again, we can read data from SIM to figure out the weather, but we need to enter these first bits ourselves. And so in order to do that, I'm going to come over to the um, Navigraph thing, but, you know, there's any other ways. Um, it, in If you didn't have Navigraph um, and you didn't know and it was just too much faff, what I would suggest is leave it at 10, set the airport elevation to whatever you see here providing you've tuned in so in this case i'd leave it at zero so i'd change the airport down to zero it's to the nearest hundred runway heading is to the nearest 10 well we're on zero eight so i'd set that to eight zero unless the slope is very obviously up or down i would always leave that at zero and with that there that is basically what i would leave it at now, because we do have access to runway length, we see here very clearly 10.4. I'm just going to change that to 10.4 appropriately. Again, you can listen to the ATIS and dial these round to whatever you want, or just read data from SIM. So there we go. Uh, outside is 26 degrees, which is no surprise. That's kind of what we saw the cabin doing before we turned the packs on. Um, Barrow 2995. Um, so I guess there's been a slight uh, update since we've heard the ATIS. And so, um, tell you what, let's adjust accordingly. 2995. There we go. Get rid of that one now. And then over here as well. That's how long I've been talking. The pressure's uh, adjusted slightly. Uh, 2995 is going to be there. Uh, 2995 there we go okie doke so with that we're now ready now one minor little thing to point out here we've got this flashing light letting us know that there's low brake pressure in the reserve system um and here we can see the normal brake accumulator is also you know in the orange and so one thing that you can do um before you've got the engines running is come over to the electric pump here turn that on briefly and you can see that's now providing electric into the hydraulic system number four if we come back to the front now we notice that yellow light is no longer flashing and we can see here that the hydraulic brake pressure in the accumulator has been restored um, and so what i'd like to do now is just push Parking my feet down released. release the brakes i'm going to push my feet down again i'm going to set brakes. the brakes and with that we've got the basically the parking brakes have been recycled at full pressure and now what we can do is uh, t turn that switch off again yes we're going to get the flashing light again but uh, with the hydraulic brake pressure restored and those completely restored brakes having set the parking brake you know we've got enough in there now uh, to deal with the pushback and speaking of which it's now ready for the pushback. So the first thing I'm going to do, if you have made use of this, again, just shift G is the default. Uh, toggle that away. And I'm now going to plan the pushback. Um, I just realized I didn't actually get the takeoff speeds, did I? Uh, so with all of this done, again, we've done that. Last but not least here, set speed bugs. And again, so we got the aircraft weight. We read that from Sim. We asked for flaps 20. We put the airport 
put uh, info in there for the runway. You put the weather in, we just said to read from the sim. Set speed bugs. Now notice here the different speeds. Decision is 114, we're rotating on 121, so very slow speed, so we're unusually light today. And if we lose an engine V2, it's 139 during the climb. Now, once you say set speed bugs, not only does it move these bugs into the correct position, it also sets your speed accordingly, 139. And 139 is this little orange triangle here. So, you know, if I manually just wind that up and down, you can see there your orange uh, there. So we'll leave that on 139. Um, something else. We're going to want to use uh, auto throttle. So you've got a few settings down here. We'll explore some of the others briefly in flight. But uh, TOD is takeoff dry. That's what you're going to want for takeoff. Con is continuous and you've got climb, cruise and go around. And literally you're going to cycle through all of those modes in, you know, from start to finish during the natural course of the flight. Um, sometimes the, the start checks want you to scroll like that. So just do it. And then auto throttle mode, I'm going to pre-select EPAS, which basically means are we going to fly a certain engine pressure ratio, a certain Mach or a certain airspeed. And certainly for takeoff, it's based on you want max power. We don't care about this trying to fly a certain speed that comes later on. If at all, we're, we're looking for the uh, power ratio there. So select that for takeoff dry. You can derate the engines here if you want. And you know what? We're so light, I am going to derate them a little bit. Let's derate them 0, 4. Um, I still think we're going to go like, uh, you know, forgive my friend, shit off a shovel. And so with all of that said, let's plan the pushback. I did say I was going to see if we can use the ground. It would seem not. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just put my better pushback. Now I've got a hotkey to activate that. Um, and again, I'm just using the better pushback mod and I guess uh, it's going to be a two phase one and then let's go. Where's runway 08? Is it this one? That's runway 28. OK, so I want to be on the other end of that runway. OK, but it's still going to be that way. Ground to cockpit. Canon knowledge. Coming through the menu when you are ready. We're ready. Ground to cockpit. Tau is driving up. Okay, no. All right, so with that, let's come up top and let's get everything ready. So the signs are on. Cabin crew, arm slides. Two to arm the slides. Let's get the beacon light on. Now, if it's uh, very cold, um, you may want to put the window heats on already. Personally, I just like to wait until the engines are running uh, before I put this demand on. I, I realize often it's done on the APU, but it. It Felix seems to have fixed it now, but it used to be a little bit buggy in how much ampage was used at the early stages of setting up the aircraft. And so just to play safe rather than trip it, I'm going to wait uh, not just for the probes, but for the windows as well until the engines are running. Now, if it was cold and things were steaming up a bit. Okay, all doors and hatches are closed. Ready to connect. Yes, I'd put it on sooner. I'm also going to arm body gear steering. So I'm uh, anti-skid, sorry. So let's turn that on and body gear steering. And I'm going to arm. So with that, you actually need to open the switch and move it up into the arm position. And for those not familiar what that is, the main wheels here at the back actually steer with that switch on. So if we have to move steer to the left, these wheels will actually steer to the right and it will make the aircraft go around a much smaller turning circle. You have to make sure that's off though for takeoff and landing or at any time you're traveling at any sort of a speed. Um, but you know, for pushback and taxiing, almost always you're going to want that on just so you can maneuver much better. Tau connected and bypass being inserted. Release parking brake. Okay, doc. So let's just make up a squawk seeing as we're not got one. I'm going to turn this over from standby to transponder mode. So all the way over there. And uh, the beacon light is already on, so everybody knows we're about to come out. Let's release the parking brake then. Brake released. Starting pushback, and you may start engines. Okay, doc. So we're clear now for engine start. And uh, so this is a relatively straightforward process in the Boeing. Not quite as easy as the Airbus, but you know it's easy enough. You've got a start valve on this old one, so turn that one in from the off to the arm. Ready to start the engines. Now that's done, we've got to come over here. Start. 
like all the uh, Bowens, uh, turn the packs off. One, two, three, all of those off. Make sure your fuel pumps are on. I should have perhaps already done that with the APU. With the exception of the center fuel tank, unless you've got fuel in it, we see it's zero. Um, so all of those are on. And with that now, we're ready to start. You can only start one engine at once to begin with off the APU, but then off the back of that, you can start multiple. Um, so I'm going to start engine three. And the reason I'm starting engine three first and not engine two is that engine two uses this tank here and we've been using this tank to run the APU. In fact, you see, we've used about 500 pounds off the APU so far. Um, so I'm going to start this engine first and this engine last to try and balance that out a bit. Uh, so let's go for engine three. You've got your start switches here. You've got system one and two. And um, let's go system one today. Push it into the ground start. And now I have forgotten something. Oh my goodness, do I feel bad. I've forgotten something. What have I forgotten? Oh, the engine bleeds. Big, big mistake. Okay, so we were talk I was talking about the bleeds early and that little engine. Notice here that the valves are closed. So that air that I was talking about blowing onto the jet engine, we didn't even open the valve. You know, there's someone saying, yeah, that's why you should use checklists. And, you know, I can't really argue with them, can I? Um, so let's open all the valves. And, you know, and, and again, we could have done that as soon as we had the uh, packs up and running. And so now we should be good to go. And so again, um, system one on engine number three, uh, into the ground, start and hold it. Starting engine three. Start of Helvolven. And as soon as you see that light come on, you can let go and the switch will hold in place. If you only press it briefly and let go before that, it'll, it'll flick off. And so let's come to the passenger view. And this is the one that we're starting. This one here. And again, there's some minor movement again because of the wind. 20% N2. And so that's the call out that you're waiting for from the flight engineer. 20% N2. And at that point, you can put fuel in. So we're going to lift up fuel on number three from the cut off to the on. idle position. And if we take a look here on the front instrument. We can see there EGT coming up, so your exhaust gas temperature, you've got your fuel, fuel flow down here. That main thing is going to let you know that, you know, there's fuel that has gone in and stabilized. Say so EGT has peaked and it's now settling back down. And yeah, so we've got a stable N1 there and you've got your EPAs there. If you want to find out more information on the flight engineers panel, um, you've got access here to your N2 as well as your N3, I believe, somewhere. Um, N2 oil, uh, maybe I'm imagining N3 then. Either way, this is now up and running. We can see oil temperature and everything else there. And that is now a good start. Now, if we take a look at this little diagram, again, we've got APU bleed on as well as bleed air from engine number three. We can see there, see there the high stage bleed. And so that means we've now complete. Hit parking brake. That means we've now got enough air to do a multi-engine start, should we wish. And so I'm going to start engine number four and number one at the same time. But first of all, just to satisfy this guy on the ground, I've got to squeeze the brakes and... Parking brakes set. Disconnecting tow. Stand by. Okay. Now, if we take a look, because we've not resupplied our uh, hydraulics, you can see they're slowly starting to eke down. And again, that's going to be replenished as soon as we get the engines uh, putting out... The hydraulics um, will just wait for the ground guy to bugger off. We'll give him the signal. Not that he can see us from down there thanks to this massive nose. But regardless, we'll give him the signal. And away he goes. All right, back inside the aircraft then. So let's start one and four. So same thing. So I'm going to go system one, ground Starting start. Four. Start of Helvolven. And number one. Starting engine one. The tower is disconnected. Start and that beam has been removed. And signal on the right. We'll see you next time. And have a safe flight. Cheers. And so now if we take a look here, we can see N2 coming up for engine four there. Engine one next. And again, once that hits 20, we expect to hear the call out from the flight engineer. 20% and 2. 20% and 2. 
And so he's calling for the engines respectively. I don't like to immediately, I just wait like, a, you know, three or four seconds. Light up. Not essential, but I just like it. Oh, that one's Light up. sticking a little bit. There we go. Off. Sometimes it depends exactly which way you're viewing. And then last but not least, number two. Engine stabilized. Ground start. Engine two. Engine stabilized. You can actually start all three Start engines at once. Once the uh, once there's once the APU and one engine are running, you can start all three. But just waiting on this. Well, let's not dilly dally. Twenty percent and two. Let's put the fuel, fuel right on. on. Just to get on with it, light and there we can see EGT coming up, so it's lighting fuel flow is obviously Doctor going off. up with that N1, so it's spinning up keepers. And as soon as that spikes, and you know where the spike is based on where that Engine red stabilized. indicator is, that is known as a stabilization. We can see fuel is level, speed is level, and the engine temperatures has dropped down. Okay, so the engines are running, but they're not yet supplying pressure to the air conditioners, they're not yet supplying power to the aircraft so that's what we need to deal with next and so first we'll come to the electrical panel here and to change from the APU or our auxiliary power unit over to the engines we just close the generators to the respective engines so I'm going to close one close two close three close four and now the engines are supplying all the electrical power to the aircraft you can see these have been kicked off uh, we know that is confirmed not just by the switch but it says here field off and that uh, it's the gen here is open and so with that it's already safe to shut off the apu but i'm going to close the bleed air first we've already got bleeds from the engines and um, so let's close the bleed off from the apu and so now the apu is literally just idling away it's doing nothing it's not supplying power it's not supplying bleed so we may as well shut that off and with that, the APU can start cooling itself and disappearing. Let's get the packs back on then. The engines are already supplying bleed air, and so I'm just going to open them all to the 50%. I'm also going to turn these fans on. That's just going to recirculate the air around. And then the gaspers, you know, those are those little twizzly things above the heads of the passengers. The reason I don't like using that on this aircraft is... Although it sounds like, oh yeah, that's a difference. Actually quite loud versus some of the other sounds. And so it's just a personal preference based on the sound that I leave that off, generally speaking. We've already got trim air and everything else there. So now let's just finish off. So you've got your galley power. So, you know, cook for your ovens, your kettles and whatnot. Um, you've got four buses here because it's such a large aircraft. So we're going to go one, two, three, four. Again, you want to make sure that your engines are on before you do this. If you're using your APU, you can turn one of them on if you want to pretend that, you know, let's have a coffee up front. You've got your split system here. So this is like, you know, your aircraft is powered on two halves. And so what you're going to want to do under normal circumstances like now is close that split. And so, you know, if we were to lose an engine over here or even two, with that split closed, you, your left two engines are going to supply all the power you need for the right. In fact, one of these engines alone is enough to power the entire aircraft. So there's like a ton of redundancy. You've got your chillers here. So I guess your fridges. Um, you've got some fans here for the galley and the lav. I just like to put that onto automatic and so with that that side of things is done um, you want to come over here and turn your aft cargo heat from off to the normal position now so if it gets really cold especially your animals and whatnot uh, you want to turn that on and then last but not least over here you want to get all of these set to auto so these are your hydraulics and um, they're all on by default anyway when your engines are up and running but you know should things go south just set that to auto and basically uh you know there's a backup electrical system ready waiting you may just want to check uh generators one through four again all the, your engines are supplying as expected there's going to be no reason why not leave that in four uh, to verify that your apus are off you know check there that they're back down to zero so i guess you could external powers as well and then leave that on four 
and here now TR123 and you're expecting to see a slightly above zero that's normal there um, same, same for your essentials there and so basically the aircraft is generating slightly more power than it needs which is kind of what you want right you don't want slightly less or bang on because otherwise every time someone turns a little thing on you're going to have this little flicker that's the way that you want it and so with that we're sort of ready to go and so coming over here oh yeah uh, forgot over here now thank goodness for caution lights right now that the aircraft's powered i'm going to turn the probes on so left and right as well as the heat so my side window my front window your front window and your side window all set there um so let's do the quick flight controls check which can be verified here and so i'm going to push forward see the elevators going down neutral up neutral and roll to the left neutral roll to the right neutral i'm going to stand on my left rudder neutral stand on the right one neutral and so with that we are all good there and so yeah let's set the flaps so we know it's a flaps 20 so you see the head settings here are 0, 1, 5, 10, 20 or 25 and 30 as well. Um, so I'm going to move this lever back and again I've got it bound so I'm just in my head going 1, 5, 10, 20. 1, 5, 10, 20. Flaps 20. And that is your audio confirmation that you've got it right. And then if he happens to say flaps 25 or flaps 10, you know, you just waggle it till you get it right um I, i'm not somebody that's got a full uh flight set up like this hanging off my desk i'm aware some people do <laughs> not many but some do um and so you know i'm relying on like two switches to go for all of the positions all right next is your stab trim so again for takeoff this is your stabilizer or your trim or stab trim to combine the two words and again for those not familiar i'm just going to point this out when you move your stick forward and backwards, that is what happens up and down. When you change the stabilizer, you're actually changing the entire thing. And if you look closely here, you can maybe see there's like a thing here where it can swivel. In fact, if I just hold my trim down and zoom all the way in, I'm sure you'll be able to see that the whole thing is moving. And that's why the runaway stab trim is so dangerous because basically a pilot is left controlling like a quarter or maybe a third of the entire thing and you know he's lost control of like you know the <laughs> three quarters of it basically um so that's the difference between the two it's not like some aircraft where the trim just basically takes up some of the slack on the elevator it's a completely separate thing um so make sure you have that set right will restore the volume and again if you want to remind yourself on the performance there that we've done stab trim 3.6 units and again it's based on weight and center of gravity and um, like uh you know like everything so to get it to 3.6 in this case actually wasn't far off after all that twiddling there's 3.5 so about there 3.6 notice it's not in the green band it's slightly in front so that's going to be a problem so to fix that we've got this green band select here nose down notice it goes from there to there to there and what that basically does is allows the uh trim and the autopilot to use that bit of trim in other words it's it's kind of a fail safe that say it's on mid uh, in theory the autopilot shouldn't be able to spin outside of those ranges and so you know we'll just let it know there we go have you and it again if you have it set outside that you're going to get some sort of warning and so that's set now one other thing here notice this initial pitch 17 degrees that's relatively steep again because we're relatively light and the optimum climb speed is 296 which is relatively low for the 74 for the same reason we're light if we're heavy you'd see a much higher optimum climb speed all the way up to 339 knots is as high as i've been able to get it to go um and again that's because the heavier you are it's more efficient to fly faster um and so you know the optimum speed for climb is therefore higher initial pitch 17 degrees um in order to set that uh, we need to get the flight directors on so i'm going to turn it on my side then your side and if we look here 
am at the pitch there. I'm just moving it here, up, down, and you can't move it further than 15 degrees. If you look here, 5, 7, 10, 12 and a half, and there's 15. In fact, you could argue that's only 14 degrees. Uh, so we're going to have to make a mental note, It's and then another 3. And if you want to know, this here is the... It is the uh, one that you're wanting to move. I just happen to have that bound over to my HOTAS. And so, um, you know, there's not many flight controls that you'd want to bind on this one. I would certainly recommend that being one of them. And so with that, we're ready to go. Now on this, by the way, there is no separate toga switch or auto throttle switch. They basically do the same in one. So once I flick the auto throttle switch, it's not just enabling the auto throttle or arming it, it's like also hitting the toga as well. And so you may want to bind that one as well. Um, I would certainly recommend doing so. And the default setting here on your steering is going to be heading. So that's what you want. We've got our stop out there of 5000. And so we're ready to go now. Now, all of the caution lights are out except anti-skid, and the only reason that light is on is because we've got the parking brakes on. So as soon as we release parking that, anti-skid light goes off, assuming, of course, we've enabled it up here. And so with that done, we're ready to go. So let's put the turn-offs. There is now a dedicated taxi light, so you use the runway turn-offs there. And uh, yeah, with that, we're ready to go. I only have two throttles, so I have my left throttle control one and two, my right throttle control engine three and four. You know, you want to set that however you want. And with that now, there she goes. Coming over here, you can see the massive slats on, uh, under the aircraft wing there, inner, middle and outers. Uh, the inner and middle slats automatically fold away. Whoa, during the autoland, seems, oh, seems to be a slightly <laughs> uneven airport there. Didn't actually see. Oh my goodness, X-Plane need to resolve that. I guess I should have been looking where I was going. Uh, not focusing on the cinematics. Hopefully, I think we got away with it. Um, and so, rather than following any specific route, um, I already know, you know, we read runway 078 for departure, which I believe is this runway here in front of us. Um, and so I'm going to use this taxiway here. Now notice this, let me just point this out here. I'm going to just going to squeeze the brakes. Again, turn that every time I turn, come outside. I'm turning to the right quite sharp notice here these rear wheels i'm going to tighten up the turn release the brakes and watch these rear wheels here and again this is body gear steering doing its thing look at them there turning now watch this i'm going to reverse the nose and watch what these wheels do and so that right there is your body gear steering and it is incredibly effective and if we come back inside look at my ability to get around this turn here It's as easy to taxi this with body gear steering, I would say, as a 737 or an A320. It, it kind of, the turning circle and everything is kind of similar to that. Now, if you turn body gear steering off, not only do the wheels not move, but Felix has also been able to simulate like a second, much larger turning circle. And sometimes, you know, the takeoff checklist, they want you to turn that off and you may decide to run the takeoff checklist before you lined up with the runway and you'll notice what a difference that makes in lining up if you turn that off before you've lined up with the runway you need to swing around much wider on the runway to you know to line up um so where possible you know leave that set to taxi until the last possible minute unless you are sort of worried that you might forget and then in which case you know just give yourself a little more room and, I, and I'll demonstrate that now in fact coming over here so you've seen I'll do one more turn with it on and then I'll do one turn with it uh, off as we line up and so everything else is pretty much set at this point 
One thing that you've got to remember on these is to turn the packs off for takeoff, regardless of, you know, whether you need it for, for performance reasons or not. And if you've seen how much black smoke these planes used to put out when they were roaring down the runway, some of the older jet engines, I I'm guessing that's maybe something to do with. They don't want the cabin filling with that. But I don't know. Don't quote me on it. I'm just suspecting here why that may be i could of course be taught in complete nonsense notice there is no rto setting on the auto brake and um, so if you do have to abort the takeoff it's down to you to pull the boards out stand on the brakes and all the rest of it um yeah you know the aircraft doesn't do that for you and let's assume now atc's cleared us and so i'm just going to stand on brakes briefly strobe light on wing light on this way i'm going to do it and um, we'll put the inboard lights on uh, come down here we'll set the transponder to tara uh, everything else is set uh, coming in back here so i don't forget turn the packs off if it's crucial you don't forget this because once we start climbing the last thing you want to do is you know not have a pressurized cabin so once you're up you know pretty soon you're going to want to remember that you know it's okay it's like it's not going to have an instantaneous because again even though the pump's not on it's not you know you're 10,000 the cabin isn't instantly going to be 10,000 it's going to take a little while to catch up but it will catch up with you um, and if you start hearing the alarm binging and you're like oh dang it we're at like 20 some thousand and so just beware oh one last thing i completely forgot is let's pause here we've got the altitude here so this is basically cruise as you can see it's set for thirty-one thousand. now the manual actually says uh, but it's based on like a real life thing so let's say you were cruising at thirty thousand feet it says set it to 31 and that slight reduction in cabin pressure, in other words, it's going to be 3,400 feet instead of 3,000 feet, is basically good for the structure. You know, you're not putting as much strain on the cabin as would otherwise be. Um, so it's up to you. But you can see the pressures that used to be are much higher than today. You know, if normally if you're cruising at 35,000 feet, and um, the altitude in the back is going to be like 8,000 feet. You know, and back then, look at this, it was less than 5,000 feet potentially. So, you know, that's one of the examples where, you know, some of the aviation stuff has gone backwards a little bit. And no doubt to save money, it's no doubt cheaper to produce a cabin that is less able to be pressurized than what used to be all right so let's take an example here of the turn so full lock here and look how easy there we were able to make that tight turn in fact room to spare and now i'm going to turn body gear steering off by disarming we're going to roll onto the runway quick cursory glance to the right even though i know that i'm playing by myself but it's a habit i guess and so now without the body gear steering i mean just trust me on this the wheels no longer move at the back but now look at the difference i'm gonna slow down a bit put full lock on and look at the difference look how much longer it's taking the nose to get around and then not only that but how much more it's going to swing around once it's done it. Remember, we turned on the taxiway and we had room to spare. Now we've turned on the runway and we're almost back on center line, having basically been over the white edge. Now, if we'd repeated that when nose gear steering on and we were near the white edge, we'd actually be aligned basically in line with that sort of white rectangle of certainly a ways further over to the right. And so again, it's a maneuvering thing. Anyway, so was in position. We've already got it turned off. We've turned the packs off. We told everybody to sit down. All the lights are on. The transponders on. Everything else is on. Engine flights start one, two, three, four. So that's like your continuous relight. That's all on. Start of valve can come off now. Everything else there checks out. Uh, trims done. Flaps done. All of that. So uh, we know, you know, if we're going to abort, what we're going to do. Uh, transponders on you may want to turn your weather radar on if it's bad weather it does eat into your frames a little bit but it's by nowhere near as bad as it used to be if you are interested in seeing that come down here to your weather radar you've got your standby uh, just turn it on there system one so my side uh, you may wish to tilt your antenna up that is simulated 
and then come over here and just turn this on to, I don't know, 25, 50. Uh, just give it a moment or so. Let's push it out to 150, see if we see anything at all. Could just be that to give it time to warm up. We're not going to wait too long. Let me point the antenna down. Uh, I'll tell you what. Well, uh, we'll take a look in the air. Let's leave it at that for now. Uh, let's just go for it. Okay. So we know what we're going to do. If you remember, once we're in the air, it's going to be legs page. And we've got legs page on every system. And again, if it isn't, you've got the status page uh, for whatever reason. Status page or your position page. Just come over to your legs page and just wait to press enter, enter once we're in the air. And you can see that selecting jets automatically because that is way zero to way one. I've uh, pressed enter once there by accident. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, so with that set, everything else is set. Check that the brakes are off. We're going to put the second set of outboard lights on, which is our little indicator that we're getting ready to go. I'm going to start the clock, wind up the engines. Light forward pressure. Stabilised. And with that, let's hit the togas. Throttles advance. setting the thrust now there we go and so with that keeping an eye on the speed the first tick is the decision let's ease the forward pressure the second tick is the decision speed uh, sorry the road first tick is decision rotate there's our rotate and then the orange if we should lose an engine now remember it's 17 degrees so i'm going to put it about there there we go 17 degrees Turn the sound down a bit. I'm going to bring the gear in. Gear up. I'm going to manually just pull my trim back. It's wanting to pull down a little bit just to stabilize that climb. And right now I'm on a stabilized climb. Passing a thousand feet. And at this point, I remember I need to left turn. And I gear. believe it was 050. So let's set that. And I'm just going to manually follow my flight director for now. And now I'm going to change over from takeoff thrust to climb thrust. And so in order to do that, expect a massive drop in engine thrust. There we go. And so the only way to sustain flight here is to reduce the rate of climb. So I'm just letting the nose dump below that initial pitch. I'm just going to manually give myself something perhaps even a little lower than that. There we go. Kind of satisfied with that. You may wish to go flaps 10, especially if you're heavy, and just give the takeoff thrust a little longer. At this point, I'm going to move autopilot onto the first setting. What this is going to do is keep the pitch and just wings level. I know I want to go 050. I know I want to go to 5,000 feet, so I'm going to go autopilot full, and that is now doing the head in here and up to 5000 and I want to make sure I can control the vertical speed so I'm going to move this switch from off to VS and I'm going to reduce my vertical speed to about 500 feet a minute and I'm going to turn this switch to altitude select and what that's going to do is ensure that we stop climbing at 5000 feet if I left that off it would just ignore this and keep continuing to climb at 500 why just 500 feet because i'm wanting to accelerate and you can flaps see 10. that's happening now so flaps 10 each one of these is another notch of flaps so let's go flaps five flaps five and i'm now going to start increasing my climb i'm going to come back real quick and turn the packs on so i'm just going to go half 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 because we've not got many people I'm going to turn the supplementaries on and keep the gaspers off for the same reasons as before. Just reducing slightly the climb. And we're basically capping out now at 5,000. And we're just about to push through where we can go to flap spawns. Level up. Um, so let's do it. Let's assume now ATC flap says uh, continue to climbing up to, uh, I don't know, let's just say 16. Um, so with that set, VS kicked out because we got close to our climb. 
I'm just going to reduce the rate of climb slightly. Continue to accelerate in while we climb. Let's go back to about 500 feet. I'm also going to move the gear to the off position. So the final notch there, so we can bring the spoiler, uh, the slats in. So flaps one to zero, right? They're the slats as uh, most aircraft. Just going to let it get a little faster. There we go. Let's bring those in. Flaps up. And now unless we've got permission for a high speed climb, we're going to have to drastically increase our vertical speed or we can switch over here to IAS mode. And what that's going to do is maintain whatever speed you had at the time you flick the switch. It doesn't care what you've got set here. It's going to go for it was about 245. And so no matter what I have set here. So let's just say I'm going to move this to 250 to remind myself you know, that's kind of where I want to be. Now, let's say I want to accelerate to 250. Well, the way to do it is to go over to VS, slightly reduce the vertical speed, wait for it to get to 250 and then switch this one over again. So three, two, one, uh, right about now. And that now is going to tinker with the VS as required to maintain 250. It may increase or decrease. Certainly if there's turbulence, you wouldn't want to fly on this. You'd want to stick to VS mode. Okay, one other thing, especially if it's cold now that we're up and away, um, you've got a time to think you want to set your fuel heat to auto one through four. Um, quick cursory check again, make sure that the packs are on. Um, make sure that the cabin's pressurizing. You'll know because you'll see this differential pressure here and that's going to start climbing the higher we get. Um, you know, up, up to a potential of 9 PSI, I believe these days, most aircraft, it's uh, somewhere between seven and a half and eight is the limit. Now uh, you see the cabin vertical speed is 500 feet a minute. Uh, it's automatic, but you can change the rate here. Um, so as I increase the DIC, and that's just gonna hurt everybody's ears. Um, if you're heavy, you may even wanna decrease it just for uh, comfort purposes. And yeah, so here's we've got the fuel totalizers. You can see how much fuel the engines are guzzling on the climb out each, which is a huge quantity of fuel. I think the modern 737s and A320s use less fuel than this in total uh, on climb out. Uh, never mind just one engine, although don't hold me to that. It's very close anyway. Uh, quick fuel totalizer there, currently 50,000 pounds. Of course, you've got your individual quantities here and when you're low on fuel one of the things you're going to want to do is you see number one main and number four main are much lower than the middle you've got your reserve tanks once you're up and away especially if it's low you're going to want to open those reserves and that fuel now is going to drain in from the reserve tanks which is basically the very extreme tips of your wings and trickle into your main tanks once that's over and done with and you notice it just shut those off again and so with that done, we're through 10, so we can clearly start accelerating now. So same procedure again, vertical speed. I'm going to reduce the climb and I'm also going to come over here. Remember, we had takeoff. We went to continuous when I said I'm now going to switch that to climb mode. I'm also going to restore my engine um, reduction there to zero. Now, usually that's cancelled out anyway. Gradually, the higher you get, but regardless i'm going to set that to zero so with that we're still on climb mode we're on a plus we're not shooting for speed or what or mac we're setting for a climb thrust all the way up to cruise and that's still done today the way that you adjust your speed is by adjusting pitch now optimum speed was i think 297 i think 300 will do and so again increased vertical speed And switch over to IAS. At some point, you're going to want to jump over to Mac. Depends where you're going. And let's assume now ATC clears us all the way up uh, to, I don't know, let's just say 20. I think we were 29,000 on this flight, if I recall. Let's have a real quick look. Charts, page one. 
and indeed to flight level 290, so 29,000. So as per instructions, it set cabin pressure here up to 30. And we'd actually already gone through that, so there's already a slight reduction in cabin pressure despite that. And so cabin pressure is just going to be just 3,000 feet. One thing that I neglected to do was go direct to the uh, jet's waypoint. Um, so let's hit enter. And if you want to know where that is, just switch over to your INS. Uh, this is going to point towards and... I think we've already long gone past it. <laughs> it's a slight mistake. I was focusing on other things. Um, so let's go instead direct to the next waypoint. Uh, which I've forgotten what it is. Um, so if we come over to the waypoint page. Oh, it was our custom uh, waypoint was the next one. Um, so to go to direct to that one, I'm going to come over to the direct one again. And I'm going to start typing the first few letters in, which in this case is CUST. Uh, C. Now, if there were more waypoints beginning with C, you may not get the one that you want. But in this case, it's that is the one that we want. I'm going to hit enter. Hit enter, and now we're going direct from where we are to our custom waypoint. I'm going to tell the autopilot, instead of flying the head in, fly the INS mode. And now the autopilot is going to steer direct from here. Surprise, surprise, to custom. Now if we take a look here, I like to put uh, the legs pay. No, sorry, no, no, correction. The flight plan page my side FPL and that's giving me the distance and so here you can see it's about 32 miles 31 on 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 this side it's not it this again it's like it's operating independently so if we come over to the flight plan page here it says no track so again just go um, direct to C you know, I was a bit. I should have really pressed enter, enter after uh, takeoff, but I was distracted. We'd already flown past away points, so cust AA again, accept. And now, if um, that's going to jump over in a minute, yeah, there we go. To the that happened by itself. The course page, and so this is how I like to roll. Course page, your side. That's telling me what heading do I need to go, how far, if any, of am I off track. Um, so in this case, um, a mile to the right of track um, and that is being corrected as we turn right on course. We're 30 some degrees too far to the left and that's why this correction is taking place. That's because we weren't heading directly towards our waypoint. We were heading 90 degrees off angle when I asked the autopilot to go. And the exact heading we want to go ideally is 159 degrees uh, magnetic. we take a look there we're just passing through 150 right now and depending on um, how close it's going to be so look at this we slightly overshot the center by 03 and so now look at this the autopilot is automatically turning too far to the right by seven degrees eight degrees nine degrees and that's to correct for that zero point now one mile um, so it's uh, potentially overcorrected. we're now in line and so the autopilot's now got to correct the other way again and um, you can see here we've got 21 miles to go to the next waypoint and so at this point uh, <laughs> No pun intended. Here is the range um, that we set on your side, which was actually the VOR of our departure. We're actually slightly edging towards it, and that's because after takeoff, we did this huge right turn that must have been slightly beyond 90 degrees. See there, the airport's off um, somewhere over to our uh, somewhere down there by about 40 miles. Um, and now with a left turn, it's basically right on the 90. So it is a relatively short flight, and if we look here, just 140 miles until our end destination, now 139. And we're almost up to cruise. And so it's already time to start preparing for the descent. And so what I'm going to do, airport page, is clear out all of these and just type in our end destination, which in this case is uh, TNCM, Tango, November, Charlie, Mike. 
and if we take a look on the approach page um vor clearly we're not be doing our nav today and um, let's pick which is most suitable so there's x-ray so this assumes that basically we fly over the vor and double back now that VOR is in our flight plan, so this is a valid approach, but uh, it seems a bit of a waste of time. If we take a look at Zulu, this looks much more appropriate. We can grab that from various waypoints. Well, how do we know? Well, let's have a look at our flight plan. Sluggo seems to be where we're going through. Now, do we see a Sluggo? No, we don't, but I'll tell you what we could do. We could go direct to one of these here. Um, or we could just switch over to St. Martin VOR and approach through these radials. And so what, let's tune that in. So 113.0, there is no ILS. So I'm gonna tune that in my side and see if we're picking this up yet. Now, even though we're set here in INS mode, that doesn't stop our VOR system working over here. It, the INS mode just takes control of this system here, and that's reflected again by the fact here it says INS uh, System 1. If your side was running, it would say INS 2. And so these distances here are based on INS waypoints and ground speed. This here is always going to be your VOR DMEs. Um, and so the needle there pointing towards our destination, you know, arrow one, and you can see 121 miles as the crow flies, about one, two, zero degrees. So taking a look here, if we're approaching this from one, two, zero degrees, it looks like we're gonna be quite close to Juice and a little further from Gabul. And um, so we may potentially wish to go fly direct to Juice here. Again, if ATC may give us that. Um, and so, I guess after Sluggo, if we come over to the waypoint page, we could insert that. So to Sluggo PJM, which was the VOR, I'm going to hit enter to, oh no, clear, sorry, come up. Sluggo, enter, and that creates a gap between Sluggo and PJM. And I'm going to try that waypoint there. Juice. J. U. I C E enter and now it looks like there's two choices of juice so somewhere else in the waypoint uh, in the world is another waypoint known as juice usually number one is going to be the best one even on this old system but it's just worth confirming north 18 west 63 well that kind of tallies if we have a real quick look at our status here so a position rather north 18 west 64 we know we're close to the destination so i'm going to accept that and um, enter to accept all right so we're up at cruise right close so this is going to go really quite quick and so what you're going to want to do, because again, this thing is going to level off at 29,000. We're still set for climb thrust. So we're going to basically accelerate and accelerate and accelerate at this point. And so you're going to want to switch over from climb to cruise. And then instead of EPAS mode, you're going to want to switch over to Mac mode. And what that's going to do is fly you a suitable Mac setting for cruise it's not actually gonna dial in what you've got set here it's just gonna fly at what's economical it's if we're a bit higher typically it's around eight mac eight five eight six eight seven absolute maximum speed of the aircraft at the right height you can get it up to 90 percent of the speed of sound without getting the barber pole clacker going All right, coming on real fast now, 101 nautical miles. We're at 29,000 feet, which basically means 87 miles. We also want to add 10 on because we're at 100 knots above 200. And so basically we're at top of descent already as, as quick as that. And so what I'm gonna do is just roughly position my throttles where those are. I'm gonna disengage the auto throttle and I'm gonna bring that power back slowly. And I'm going to start my descent. Now, before I do that, I'm just going to put the altitude into hold mode. This is how you want to cruise. 
and now it's going to give me time to change this so let's drop down let's just say to 12,000 initially I'm going to set this to VS mode and I'm going to start my descent now nice and gentle about a thousand feet a minute I'm just going to bring the power back now ideally I'd like to do this a little smoother but because things are you know I picked a, sh a flight that was perhaps a tiny bit too short granted most of this video was based on before we got going um, so now we're idle now if you want like a level change um, again it's kind of the opposite of what we were doing before you would set this to IAS mode and the autopilot's going to automatically twiddle with the VS to maintain speed but I had a comment from somebody who used to fly old school aircraft it wasn't 747 I forgot what he said now but it was one of the older style with this sort of type of autopilot it was based on a very precise calculation they actually went on vertical speed for the descent either way thrust idle or throttle off and in my case I think let's just go for 2500 feet and we'll see what that gives now ideally I think maybe I want a little bit more because the speed there is a little low um, so let's go to 3500 and then we'll update our calculations once the speed adjusts accordingly now let's have a look at the VOR here we can see 2600 feet is the absolute floor and then ideally it wants us to descend down to 1600 feet once we're within uh, the radial now how far is the radial well it's 10 miles 10 DME arc and usually they give you two to three miles to turn um, so assuming we're direct juice here um, and we know here that juice is 21.8 miles from the VOR thanks to this figure above and so I think what I'm going to do at this point is just go direct juice just keep things nice and simple um, uh, so once again uh, flight plan Slugo 41 yeah let's just go direct juice um, so I'm gonna hit the direct J and now there's an example look it's picked jets but I want juice so I'm gonna have to type in the second letter J U and now it's got it and so yes accept boom now this one doesn't have juice in because we didn't copy the updated flight plan that doesn't mean it's useless at telling us where we are or still that we're going to the same ultimate destination it's just not going to include juice and with that uh, headings or distances on this one here are not going to reflect that it will still tell us though uh, the distance to TNCN which is our ultimate destination um, so it's not entirely useless but certainly you'd want to copy this flight plan over now again hit remote master remote slave and copy it over um, but I'm just a little busy for that at this point so I'm going to keep the flight plan on here see just 38 miles now to get to juice and so I'm exploiting this we're actually increasing speed which is fine more parasitic drag and I'm going to drop this down to 10 and again outsell so that once we reach 10 we don't continue dropping through it's going to level us off there that's going to be a nice uh, opportunity to slow the aircraft down as well again we're approaching super fast and once we are at juice again we can descend down to 2600 now we're only going to be 21.8 miles away from the VOR um, so uh, basically it feels like we're too high and too hot so I'm going to pull the boards out And that's gonna at this speed just absolutely dump energy like nobody's business now the speed brakes of it the spoilers you know it's above the wing might spoil the airflow the faster you are the more effective they become kind of like the parasitic drag it goes up with the square of the speed so if you're twice as fast they're four times more effective um, so you know if you want to lose more energy the best way to do it is to go faster in the first case because it's less efficient to fly faster beyond 
usually it's like flaps up plus like 10 knots so you could argue if we were trying to just linger as long as possible we'd want to fly about 225 at the minute if you want to lose as much speed as possible you want to be right up against a barber pole like in an ideal world right obviously you want to be right up against it you want to give yourself a little bit of margin for error all right a real quick way to get landing speed without doing it properly again you do it properly if you've got time we don't let's come over to landing perf read data from sim we're going to go flaps 30 airport elevation well, i happen to know it's at sea level i'm going to leave all the rest blank read data from sim we do have some light winds now i'm aware runway heading and everything is off what i'm interested in is these speeds and those speeds are going to be more or less the same regardless of how long the runway is or runway heading the the speed is the speed it's going to depend more on the you know the, the temperature and the pressure versus uh wind speed so i'm going to set those bugs it will obviously affect auto break distance so disregard these figures and because i know it's a relatively short runway I'm going to already dial in auto brake medium. I know the aircraft's relatively light. If it starts to look shaky, I'll stand on the brakes myself. We've not at all addressed the lighting or the signs on this flight. It's just been too quick. Although one thing, let's turn the engine ignitions off. Should have done that soon after takeoff as well. Okie doke, so here we are, 10,000 feet. I'm going to let the aircraft speed bleed off. 240 and i'm also going to come down here and set this mode to go around deselect max select speed now although the auto throttle's off at this point if i want it to fly it on i want it to maintain the speed and if i need go around thrust that's the maximum 10, okay 10,000 feet 240 i'm going to just Attention. put that in out hold altimeter two niner niner seven Two nine and nine and seven, and I think we could descend down to two point three. So let's go. Um, IAS mode, and again out cell, so we don't drop through two point three. Now let me just confirm it was two point three. No, it's two point six. My bad. Um, so just amend that there to two point six. Now we just had an ATIS broadcast about two nine nine six, I believe. Um, so let's set two nine nine six. Does TNCM have ATIS? Uh, it does 127.65. 127.65. Let's have a gander. Princess Juliana International Information X ray 1850 Zulu and 110 degrees at 9 knots. Visibility more than 10 miles. Sky conditions here at 1600. Temperature 25. 2.20. Altimeter 2997 Arriving Departing runway 10 Advise on initial contact Arriving depart 10 Well it's only ever going to be 2997 2997 is going to be about there Okay we've still got the boards out Because we had so much energy to lose I think we can afford to stow those now We've caught up with the situation and just to be lazy, I'm going to keep it on IAS descent uh, to make sure there. And the autopilot should catch up with that relatively soon. I may just give it a hand. Let's switch to VS. Increase my vertical speed. Let's shut the ATIS off. Thank you. And there we go, that's close enough, so let's switch back to IAS mode. We can see here we're just seven miles away from juice now. Um, so we're, well, we're, there we go, look, we're coming in. Now again, juice is actually off the side, this bit here, not to scale. Usually it says not to scale, but it's one of the rare instances where it doesn't. This arc here is 10 DME, so usually you've got to turn right at 12 if you're at uh, approach speed. Then we can descend down to 1,600, and then at De Beer, we start our final into the VOR. Well, where's De Beer? Here, that's at 4.9 miles away. Final approach course there, 096. We need to be on 114, though, so what I'm going to do now 
set course 114 my side and so that I can remind what final approach is 096 I'm going to set that up on your side I'm going to get my head in now to match the head in that we're currently on which is 120 130 basically bang on 135 and without changing the autopilot mode over from INS I'm just going to switch this up just to have a glance how am I doing with regards to juice and the 114 um, that I've got set here so let's have a quick glance and again I'm looking here and look at this the VOR is almost bang on I'm like half a degree maybe to the left back to the INS mode and the autopilot's actually making a left turn by itself here now direct to PJM so the autopilot has now flown to juice we know that because there's PJM with a two um, so back to radio and now I'm bang on look at this I'm bang on so I'm going to come out of the uh, INS mode which you need to do for landing um, I need to update my heading because there was a left turn there so it's about 116 it looks like and I'm going to set that mode up now head in there we go 116 and I need to fly this course at least for now until I'm about 12 miles away and so if we look here we're almost in line I'm going to turn the heading mode over again to VOR low and now we're flying in this case the 114 radial see there's a minor correction there now we're almost at our height we heard the thousand to go we're on manual thrust don't forget so I'm just going to manually give it a little bit as we approach in 2.6 and we're almost there now I'm going to put the auto throttle on which will hold 240 engines going up and that's nice so now we're at 2.6 Again, we want to hold this height, but we want to pre-select the next height, which we know is 1.6. So come over here. Don't dial it down to 1.6. First, we've got to put that into out hold. Now we dial it down to 1.6. Now all that this is waiting for is for us to flick this from off back to vertical speed mode. And then we can continue descending down to 1.6. See the autopilot is actually nudging this wheel up and down slightly. That's because I've got live weather on. There seems to be just the tiniest bit of turbulence in the area. Um, so that's understandable. So now we're about 24 miles away. And we're down through, again, we weren't bothering with lights. But I was going to say we're down through 10, so we need to make those on. Auto brake is set to medium. That's so we'd already agreed with that. Uh, we can arm the spoilers for landing, so it's not that old that you couldn't uh, auto arm the spoilers. Uh, to do that, you just uh, pull them down once. So if you have a hotkey to enable spoilers on, just just move it down once, and then they're armed. And you can see there, or you can. Uh, It's got to be oh there you go so to click it you just click on the armed position i find it easier just to you know move my spoiler up down hot key but do whatever works for you we'll put there and so you know click you'd, you'd normally wait a little bit before you did that but you know no arm and getting it in early oh yeah sid was gonna have a little look at this we should be able to see the hill actually yeah there we see it so look at this so this is the weather radar but uh, you know and clearly there is no weather i mean look at it it's a beautiful day those are actually ground reflections and that island do we see it on the minimum zoom yeah we do just i'm almost sure that is the island where we're going to and that big main green blob is the mountain and our runway is this little is basically this little bit here before the mountain if memory serves okie doke getting real close now five miles or so so i'm going to start reducing speed i'm just going to go straight down to i don't know 190 knots and i'm aware that's dropping through my minimum speeds now we can already go flaps one if we take a look the slats actually can do that at 175 but we're well below that so flaps one 
we're also going to need flaps five if you look we're already below the flaps five notch now that we can do at 250 or less well we're well below that so i'm going to move flaps five as well and um, so here we see the slats out the front and if we jump behind the wing so we can see the slat, uh, the flaps extending as well out of the back. And there we go, five degrees set. With that now, we're pretty stable. Engine's coming back up 190. So getting real close now to that 10 DMER. And again, I'm going to start a right hand turn at 12. And so uh, even though we're following the localizer in, I'm going to set my head in ready and I'm going to throw it off by about 90 degrees. And so I'm going to go for about 204. And so as soon as I get inside two, two and a half miles, depends exactly on sort of what speed you're doing. The slower you are, clearly the tighter the plane can turn. I'm going to switch this over to heading mode, but it's not for long because we've only got a correction of about 20 degrees. And so let's go now. So onto the heading mode. And with that aircraft is going to turn right 90 degrees. And I now need to set up. Now we've got a little clue here when to turn final. It's this one here, 288 degrees. But I don't think we're even going to get 90 degrees off before we get to 288. I'm just going to set myself 096 here. And so I now need to fly on this 296 final approach. See, we're already passing through 288 uh, any sec there. And you can see we're a bit... Oh. Well, we don't want to turn any further now away. About uh, 0.8 mile away. So, yeah, due to our slow speed, we were able to turn slightly tighter. Again, these arrows, uh, the single arrow pointing towards. Uh, let's get them both pointing the same way. There we go. These are pointing directly towards the airport now. Now, there's final approach. So, we need to turn left now, 9, 6. What I'm going to do is put this onto VOR lock before we shoot through the 96 final approach um you know towards the localized i keep wanting to use the words radial of course radial is away from not towards to the localizer but here you can see we're about to shoot through the middle but before but because i got vor low in before we did the autopilot's actually going to correct for that and we know at this point we're good to descend down to 1.6 so let's switch over to vs we'd already pre arm that i'm going to start a vertical descent make sure we don't drop through and i'm going to reduce my speed further now 170 knots and that's going to entitle me down to the next notch of flaps, which can't be extended at or above 238. Well, we're well below that, so let's go flaps 10. Flaps 10. And a quick reminder here, 4.9 miles, which is at a point known as De Beer, we're clear to descend. Now, you could potentially also put that in here as a reminder. Um... I'm not sure if you can just make one up that's not as part of the route um enter accept indeed you can uh flight plan so they can see 0 0.02 miles away um, and unfortunately it doesn't get more precise than the full mile there and we're getting an alert flashing letting us know we're very close there we are level at 1600 and there's no way in the uh, Boeing to descend accurately at three degrees. Um, you're going to have to judge that based on speed. So let me, it's going to take me a minute to go over this. We see, yeah, when I say three degrees, it's actually 2.98 degrees. And again, that starts at De Beer here at 4.9 miles. Now, what is 2.98 degrees? Well, if we take a look here, based on the ground speed, we can get an approximate vertical speed based on that. Well, our ground speed is currently 169 knots. Now, clearly, we're going to lose a little bit more than that. Um, and we've only got one mile to do it in. Um, uh, but if we were to do 160 knots, you can see here we'd need to be descending roughly 850 feet a minute. It actually says 843. Again, we can't really be super precise using the steam gauges. Um, but, you know, if you were good with your eyes, you could certainly aim for 850. 
um, which is going to be if we zoom in um, between these two points here. Again, to hold it that stable is going to be very difficult indeed. Um, but, you know, you can certainly make a move for it. And so what I'm going to do at this point when I unpause is set my height for mist approach. And we can see here at the top is basically 4,000 feet. And so unpause. Let's go out hold 4,000 feet. And, and now I'm going to get ready for this descent. Now it starts at 4.9. Let's continue slowing down as well. So coming up to it now. So I'm going to start the descent. And again, it takes a moment or two to get going. There's the 4.9. And we know we need 850. So it's basically going to be there. We can see just slightly less than 1,000. And a quick glance, roughly that's correct. Now, ground speed is 164. Gear let's down. dump the gear. And let's continue reducing. We've already set these bugs previous. So let's go flaps 25. 25. We're here in the horn. Just a quick check. Lights are on. Gear Signs down. are on. Back here. Go around is set. We're on speed mode. Let's reduce a bit more. And now flaps full. Now look, our ground speed is slightly less. What what does it say about 140? Well, it says nearer 700 and some. So let's reduce a little bit. And now take a look at this. Pause. Without having looked out the window at all, and I hate the way the pappies uh, disappear when I zoom in, but I can see from here we've got two white and two red. And the only thing we've been doing as best as we can is following these instructions. At this point, clearly, we're close enough to go visual. I never did set up the minimums, which in this case are about, um, and again, it, it depends on your performance here and what sort of aids that you have. But in clear visibility um, with these, uh, what's the difference actually between these two? Uh, notice one and two and V. OK, so we don't have V nav. Um, and so in this case, it's just uh, number one. Um, yeah, so we could, I'm guessing, providing visibility is down to uh, at or above 2,300, which it is, straight in. Um, and again, it's uh, 500 on the barrel, 483 on the rad alt. I think we only have the, uh, the rad alt capable here. Um, so I'm going to unpause. Real quickly go for 480 uh, some. There we go. Now let's disconnect. <laughs> And so with that, I'm flying the plane. Auto throttle still got it, and so I'm going to disconnect that as well. Approaching minimums. Five hundred minimums. All right. So with that, we're clear to land. We're on the approach speed. Don't want to get behind the curve. Three white, one red. That's fine. Now, as soon as I'm uh, flaring, I'm down, I'm going to unlock the reverses. I'm going to wait till they go green and then add power. A little bit of turbulence, which is nice. Adds a bit of something. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. There we go. Uncage. Reverses are green. I'm going to add power. Auto brakes doing its thing. 100, 90, 80, 70. 69. Idle reverse. Brakes are going to be hot, but not so bad. Going to auto release the auto brakes and stole the reverses and with that ladies and gentlemen welcome to princess juliana and so at this point it you know it's pretty much a standard thing um as you'd expect it's going to be a short taxi so apu again from the uh, stop position onto the on wait for the apu door to open and then we'll fire that thing up uh bring the flap lever in flaps up 
and again we're gonna struggle a bit for this tight turn without body gear steering so now we're slow we'll uh, enable that and if it's such a tight turn you wait you may also want to use differential thrust so you know think about that as well and you know what i mean by that is chopping these two adding that one up a bit and then swinging it round like this where the radar can come off now that we're on the ground so keep that turn going and again with body gear steering we can come round so easily I mean look at that how tight that is we didn't even use the width of the runway man Alright, so back over here, um, APU, let's start that, release, um, fuel heat off, one, two, three, four, ideally do that before landing, close these reserve tanks that have long since drained through, um, aft cargo heat can go away as well, um, the usual stuff, you know, probe heats. I forgot to put the engine ignitions on on landing, you know, that's a standard thing on basically all aircraft. I know the Airbuses take care of it for you, but the newer ones, but there was that as well. Um, and at this point, you know, if if you're doing another leg for sure, you've got your um, leave these on. If not, you know, you may as well turn them off at this point. Don't forget, though, the, you know, the drift on them. And again, see the longer tutorial about that. Oh, yeah, stop the clock as well. Uh, I guess we should really knock a minute off 42. It was more like 41. Um, right, auto brake from disarm to the off position. And with that done, let's get rid of the speed brake. I think what I'm going to do is uh, turn off packs one and three. Put pack two on high. Now APU. If we have a quick look. Yeah, that's up and running. Let's get this turn started. And so what we'll do with the APU up and running, I'm gonna um Turn window heat off, one, two, three, four. Turn the engine bleed off, one, two, three, four. Turn APU bleed on, and that's going to supply air now to that pack. I'm just going to pop it here to save a little bit of time. There we go. All right. So standing on the brakes. Parking brake set. Release the brakes. Um, so we don't lose power then. Um, just before um, galley power, going to turn off two through four. Leave one on for the coffee. The coolers uh, coming off there as well. And now APU is on the left close on the right close and that's now looking stable great shutting off four three two one coming back over here standbys off four three two one packs there can remain on as is uh, cargo heat's already off uh, gonna turn off all the fuel pumps and again the one that needs to be will remain on you can of course artificially put on a second one certainly if it's going to be running for extended period of time and then use the cross feed uh, you know to make sure that the tank doesn't run completely dry uh, engine there's been disconnected already so that's fine and with that yeah it's just a case of shutting down right so three two one um essential equipment there obviously your lights uh, strobe lights really should have been off anyway 
Um, same with the landing lights. Body gear steering will disarm that. Anti-skid, turn that off. Leave that hanging out. Emergency lights, uh, disarm that and turn those off. These here are already off, so that there. And it's all looking good. So now if lights and logo, you know, they'll be the last to go. We'll release the signs. We'll unlock the cockpit door. If you really want to get fancy with it. Uh, ground, set Cockpit shocks, ground, ground power ground. unit, um, open. Cockpit to ground, connect ground power. Let's go 1515. And let's go ground handling control. Shocks are on. Um, one, I guess. Ground power one, connected. I guess it's going to be 1, 2, and 5. Same there as well. 1, 2, and 5. Bang, 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 bang. Drive up. And so, yeah, the doors are already open and waiting, but it is what it is. Um, yeah, I won't bother turning all the lights off as well, but, you know, knock yourself out. Clearly, another one I forgot after landing the transponder. Uh, get rid of the auto throttle, set that back to default. Um, anything else back here? I basically think we're I, I think we're done there. It's just a matter of unhooking the power once it's all done. Uh, we see here ground power is now on. That we've got the lights. So I'm going to close left, close right, and with that we can get rid of the APU. So I'm going to turn trim air off first, and then turn off the recirks, turn off the supplementaries, turn off the middle pack. And so no longer requiring air, turn the bleed air off. We've already got ground supplying the power. And again, you can verify that using this external. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm going to trip the APU both sides. And verify that the APU generators are off now. And they are. And so with that, we can turn the APU off. And now we're just operating off ground power and ground power alone. And at that point, you know, you can verify all the fuel pumps are off and they are now. And so last but not least then, um, let's get rid of nav light and logo light. And then back here, battery cover is off. Let's disconnect ground power one two standby power off battery off and with that uh basically she is fully cold and dark again ready to the next flight and i'm absolutely exhausted i hope you really enjoyed that tutorial found it useful what an absolutely fantastic module and as i've said um it's one of my favorites if not the most favorite aircraft I have for X-Plane. 11 or 12, and I, I think I own about 10 or so paywares. And, and it's just absolutely fantastic. And I can't praise Fearless and anyone else who's responsible enough for it. It's a fantastic aircraft. And, you know, the, the slight hit on the frame rate, you know, it just comes with having such a highly detailed aircraft as this. And is hopefully something, you know, that can continue to be improved as as time ticks on but it's by no means the worst and with that until next time guys take care bye bye